workshop on deconstructing design. I think I have a few sort of points to make. I'm not a designer, so let me just clarify that first. You must have realized that from all the email correspondence that I had with you. The language was certainly not that of a designer, but more of an engineer. Okay. I suspect no designer will insist on eight minutes and you know two minutes here and planning that way. So <coughs> I think just putting up the slide. Slides are up. Uh, I just have some uh, uh, basic thoughts that I'll go through. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, I'd really like to thank everybody for taking their time out and coming for this workshop. Uh, what One of the unusual things which I believe, and perhaps uh, you're of course most welcome to disagree with me, is that we have a fairly heterogeneous group out here. By and large, design is discussed among engineers or creative designers or architects. I think we've tried to really create uh, a very heterogeneous group. And the fundamental belief is that the heterogeneity of thought is important to evolve maybe a new design pedagogy. Okay. We are perhaps being presumptuous in some manner, so I apologize for that. Maybe ambitious. You know, uh, I hope you agree with that part. Okay. Also, I believe that it's important to learn from different perspectives. You know, The designers, the creative designers, for want of a better phrase, I'll refer to them as creative designers and engineers as simply engineering designers, they need to talk to each other. You know, I was in IIT Bombay, we have IDC out there, okay, uh, one of the big design centers in the country. But the interaction between engineers and IDC you know, was not that strong as one would have liked to be. It was more based on individual interactions and individual uh, interest in uh, uh, corresponding disciplines. Okay. But we are hoping that that interaction will be much more. <clears throat> one of my colleagues, you know, I think he used this phrase that design tackles wicked problems. I agree, you know, then perhaps we will have to accept a wicked pedagogy for design also, okay, as it goes along, at least for the, in the near term. Uh, some motivation, many people have been asking me, why are we doing this? Okay, these are personal thoughts. Others can add to this motivating factor. Okay, first we want to have a design manifesto in order to promote design in various engineering institutions, IITs, NITs, you know, and other engineering colleges also across the country. Okay. Exposure to creative design. That is one of the things. If you look at an engineering curriculum, they do a lot of engineering design involving analysis, data analysis, you know, but we never really expose our students to creative design. We have humanities programs, so they have exposure to maybe a bit of psychology, economics, sociology, you know, uh, uh, even literature, poetry, but creative design, almost, I mean, almost nil. Maybe some IITs or some institutions might be having a bit here and there, but nothing in the a big sense. <coughs> so how can we bring this creative aspects into the whole thing? Uh, another motivation is uh, starting design schools. Okay. That is, we are hoping that every IIT, NIT will have either a design school or a design department, something similar to what maybe you know IIT Bombay has it or uh, IIT Guwahati has it. Okay. So we will have to really pro proliferate that particular aspect. And the third component, as you see out there, is even if someone is not pursuing a degree in design, Okay, he or she could be taking at least one or two courses in the overall four-year undergraduate engineering program dealing with creative aspects. Okay. Uh, these I didn't put, put I couldn't even uh, give a proper title for this. Okay, uh, within IIT system, engineering design has a very very strong component. So we have gone a little soft on this. So my engineering colleagues and I ask for their apology. So don't feel bad about it. Most of the presentations, barring a few, deal with uh, creative design aspects of it. Uh, primarily because we do engineering design is almost like bread and butter things for most of us in IIT. Uh, <coughs> on a lighter vein, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of emails, you know, why eight minutes? Maybe there is some cosmic reality which uh, uh, gives this uh, special relevance to the number eight. I have not done that uh, study. Maybe I will do it after the workshop. But as they say in the, you know, Indian proverb, you know, we do talk of design, okay? And I thought design by very nature should uh, subscribe to the Indian proverb, insan ko ishara kafi. Right? So we don't need more than eight minutes to get across our uh, message. Uh, my apologies for not being able to accommodate all the speakers. There were many, many requests. We really tried very hard uh, to bring in a large number of uh, people. But still, I believe we have left out a few and very good ones. So I sincerely apologize to those who have been left out. My hope is that during the open sessions, we have a fair amount of discussion sessions. You'll be able to say a few words out there. Okay? At least you'll be able to put forward your thought. Okay? So with these, you know, I thank you very much once again.
morning and let me also echo Uday and welcome you to this uh, workshop on design. Uh, I thought that uh, I would start with a few general remarks. Again, I have a short presentation. Uh, for me, I think what is of most important, to what is most important to me in this workshop is the connection between design and education and in two ways. One is, uh, you know, design for ex the elements of design in engineering education and the other is design education itself. Uh, I thought that I'll start with a few general remarks uh, based on my own understanding of, uh, you know, what is the context and where do we fit in. And uh, here I've just taken some ideas from uh, a talk that I recently heard on really what is different between art and science. If you look at art, the key word there is create, whereas in science, the key word is discover. And in both of these fields, you know, the kind of evolution of progress is very different. Then if you look at engineering and technology, that is again somewhat different. And the key word there might be invent, because engineers sort of create uh, things like TVs or tape, tape recorders and things like this. And one can think of that as uh, a sort of combination of science and art. And finally, if you look at design, uh, you know, where both function and form are important, then we can think of that as a combination of art and technology. And you know, for all these uh, various processes of products or services which involve design, we can think of you know different sort of compositions of art and technology in there and so let me just show a few examples so here is an example where you know the art component is very high you know these are some designs of chairs by famous architects and there is of course some technology component but it's smaller on the other hand if you look at something like this which you know being a chemical engineer, we look at these kinds of things. The technology component is high, and you know there's a lot of detailed uh, calculations and things that are done. But there is also a significant component of art in this type of uh, design as well. And the reason that we have this component of art is that it's almost impossible to sort of come up with a single design. There are always many, many options, uh, you know, there are almost infinite options. And before you get down to the details of designing each small component of this huge system, uh, there's always a sort of master plan of, or a master design that happens. And at that level also, there are many choices to be made. So a designer then has to develop an aesthetic to decide which are the best designs, which are the designs that are most likely to work and so forth. So just as a graphic designer has so many options and then chooses something, similarly a designer, before he starts actually putting down what are the, what is the structure of a chemical plant, he also has to have uh, some aesthetic. And so in that sense, there is a component of art in there as well. And this is true for many other kinds of designs, whether you're making a, you know, a large uh, aircraft or making a computer chip. All of them have some kind of an overall design, then subsystems, and then integration, optimization, and so forth. And all of them have an element of art in there. And then, of course, there are some things where both there is high in technology and high in art. And these are the kinds of things that make a very strong connection uh, with the users. So how does this connect with education? I feel design provides a sort of unifying thread. And it's important to in integrate design into various curricula. Because you know this kind of design thinking, uh, it prepares people to be more creative. So this is what I have written here, is to introduce some kind of a creative element in science and engineering through design and art. But then there's also a need for creative designers with some kind of exposure to technology. And the hope is that with this kind of uh, you know, inputs into education, that our students will be more innovative and uh, I, you know, 
come up with newer ideas and new products, which is really the need of today. Uh, with that as some kind of a background, uh, I think what I would like to say is that today there is a case for making connections between institutions that there are all of us doing many quite different things, uh, but there may be some underlying similarities. I'd like to end with, you know, just a brief overview of our industrial design center at IIT Bombay. So we're lucky that we have this design center there. It was set up in 1969, and from what I believe that when it started, it was supposed to be a sort of temporary center which might later move to another place. But now it has become quite integrated into the institute. And really, in 1969, fine arts came into an engineering institution. Today, the, inst uh, the center has grown. There are about 27 faculty members. They have programs at the master's level and at the PhD level. And they're also thinking of starting a bachelor's level program. But besides the programs that the center runs itself, uh, there is interaction uh, with the rest of the institute in the form of a minor program that is taken by our undergraduates and also electives which are extremely popular. I thought that I'll end by just showing a few uh, notable contributions that they're doing extremely well in spite of being in a sort of technology environment, they're still able to flourish. And for example, the new rupee symbol uh, was uh, actually uh, created within the center. We are going to see a film by Professor Shilpa Ranade, whose full-length animated film was recently shown at the Toronto International Film Festival. And then one of our colleagues from IDC, Kirti, is has been the designer of a new national memorial to commemorate uh, the salt mart, which is coming up at Dandi. And in fact, uh, there will be a sculptures work, sculptor's workshop starting from tomorrow. Uh, you know, and we are going to do something like 80 life-size statues of the marchers in the campus. And we'll have sculptors from all around India and the world. And you're all invited uh, to visit. So with that, uh, welcome once again, and I look forward to today's uh, discussions. Thank you. So, well, thank you, Uday and Devang. I will now request Professor Atwankar. We will be shortly joined by the minister, but we can go ahead at the same time. So may I request Mr. Professor Atwankar now to make his presentation on reusing in your report? Yes, so would you like to do it from there? Want to continue? Uh, Thank you for this uh, opportunity to make a presentation here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, India report, which was presented by Charles Seams in 1958. Can I have the slides now? Uh, almost 55 years have passed since this report was written. Too many things have changed. Okay. Uh, a lot of things have changed in the past. For instance, uh, we were called a third world country earlier, then we became a developing economy, and now we are called as emerging market. We are also included part of BRICS countries. We have a young population and fairly large percentage of them. We also have an open market and globalization. Uh, uh, there are some visible changes too. For instance, uh, n nobody envisaged in 1958 that cities will grow to the extent that they have grown now. You can see the kind of problem that Bombay is facing, and sooner or later, other countries will also face, uh, other cities will also face. Nobody expected mobile to be that popular, and it's so powerful. Nobody expected internet to be so important and create communities which are virtual. Uh, what I'm going to do is to only talk about a very small part of it that changes that has affected design process, and that is the focus of that talk here. Uh, I start with uh, some 
interesting simple statements. For instance, most of the real world problems are considered as wicked problems. Okay? Uh, there are several tests for wicked problems. One of them is that you cannot understand the problem unless you discover a solution. Okay? And this is something which uh, uh, Horst Rittel came out with uh, from Berkeley. Uh, the second interesting test is that wicked problems have no correct solution, no true solution, no optimum solution. It has only good, bad, worse solutions. And it requires a very different way of handling wicked problems and some solutions have to be very inclusive in reach and inclusive in conceptualization process and that's the problem I'll talk now. Uh, I thought I'll give you an example of a banking. This is not something which IDC has done, but uh, some other people have done it. Uh, there was an effort to bring banking to villages, and it has never succeeded because you could never have, uh, the cost of transaction for a bank is so high that you could never deal with villagers who just save 20 rupees or 30 rupees and put it in the bank. Uh, this is an interesting solution that a company came out with, a, a Little World with SBI, and it's called as SBI Tiny, which has got a biometric reader, which has got a printer, which has got a, a small mobile phone, and a smart card. Uh, what is interesting about this solution is the transaction cost is less than a rupee. So it's possible now for people to put 20 50, uh, to 30 rupees in a bank and also withdraw them. The way it works is there's a, there are banking correspondents and agents who are appointed by state bank. They go to the villages at a fixed time, stand normally in a village panchayat or a school, and people come there and transact business. They either give money or take money from her. Uh, it's a very efficient and simple way of handling. Uh, that what is interesting about this project is that even the data was collected by villagers themselves. The villagers were trained by creating institutions which allow people to use this system quite effectively. So in the, uh, the banking correspondence as well as uh, the agents were trained and it requires only three days of institutional training and two days of field training for them to operate in the field. Uh, what did I learn from this? The learning is that Inclusive solutions demand extending the scope of design beyond products. It would mean designing institutions, it means designing services, and products form a part of that service. And this is increasingly true in the modern world. Second, most real problems are too complex for a single discipline to handle. You would find that they would probably not be able to do justice to that. Uh, we are currently working on uh, in villages in uh, near Bombay. Uh, with public health uh, centers, and uh, this is a TCS project. And we find that Maharashtra has a good system in place. And there are villages and there are Adivasis around. Main problem seems to be, seem to be not uh, the fact that doctors are not there, the medicines are not there, but the belief system that Adivasis have is so very different that the iron supplements which are given free to everybody who is uh, pregnant uh, ladies do not take them because they believe that the b bigger babies is more problem for them in terms of delivery. They do not give first two days, mother's milk is not given to the children because they feel that uh, their belief system doesn't permit them. The children are not even given clothes for the first five days, they're just left the, as they are. So it's not that the solutions don't exist, the technology solutions, the medical solutions exist, but uh, the relationship between the people and the solution is not really working. Uh, what really happens in this is uh, what you really need is a new inclusive thinking style and a new inclusive technologies managers, policy makers, and social workers and designers come together, work with people to come out with ideas. And that's exactly what we are planning to do now. Uh, health sector kind of reacted to this in a very different way. They came out with the concept of what they call as community medicine. And there, were, there is a branch in medicine which deals with community medicine. It's also possible to look at this as a part of uh, engineering. Can, can there be a community design? Can there be a field uh, engineering labs you know, which work with villages directly? And it integrates people's problem in the educational process itself. If medicine can do it, so can we. I personally believe that hospital is a good metaphor for design schools. You know, the way hospi teaching hospitals work, maybe engineering and design universities should work like that. Uh, this would mean, I mean, one can simply put it saying this is just an interdisciplinary way of working, but this is not true. I've done a lot of interdisciplinary job, and there is a st it looks simple on paper, but it's not easy to work in an interdisciplinary group at all. And let me explain you what kind of problems you face. 
uh, I believe that our thought processes are controlled and constrained by the way we uh, are trained. And the disciplines also tells you what you do and what you don't do. I'll give you a simple example of that. And that is uh, a problem of teaching simple arithmetic to children in school. Uh, a typically, a teacher would come out with teaching aids. The IT person will come out with uh, uh, computer-based training. A TV broadcaster will come out with his own programs. Uh, a game designer would come out with something else. Uh, can I have that video? So one of my students, group of students came out with, uh, uh, you can see this on the screen. There's a game that is played in the villages. One member will throw the pebble to get the digit, and other will take care of operator. Now let's play the game with number 29. So actually it is played by children and they learn the addition and the uh, process itself. Okay. Uh, so the point that I'm making, we see solutions through our uh, uh, own discipline and everybody has his own solutions and they, they, it's not easy to work with an interdisciplinary team at all. One of the ways designers think is that we think in terms of reframing the question. And the way the students framed this question was instead of teaching maths, can I make this as a play? You know, Can I see play as uh, the basic process and the process they learn? And that also can be done without hardware. Uh, okay, we have less time, so we'll just go a little faster. Uh, disciplines also try to simplify problems. You know? And one simple example of that is, uh, most of the problems are not that easy to simplify. Let's look at this problem. Uh, this happens in right in front of IIT in the main gate. You could see, can you have the video? I'll just show you for a quick two, one minute. Okay. To see this as a traffic problem or to see this as a policing problem is not right. This is. Almost everybody is trying to look at his own shortcut, and that's the reason why this confusion gets created. So the point I'm trying to make is that tomorrow's solutions would likely to be conceived more as ecosystems, where design of institutions, design of services, and design of police, uh, po policies would become quite important. And product will become part of that component. So my personal feeling is that engineering, humanities, management, and uh, even NGOs should come together to solve problems. And this is not something which is easy in an academic environment. I personally believe that new age design is somewhat like jamming in music, you know, where people sit together and work out solutions and not the traditional way where you have an orchestra and there's a conductor who sort of decides uh, what, what to do. I'm not saying that that kind of design is not required. S uh, you can see some of the successful designers belong to that category, Steve Jobs or Frank Gehry, architect. They are they produce iconic products through the process which is somewhat similar to kind of an orchestra where they decide every dis take every decision. But more and more problems are of the kind where people have to get together and work together. <laughs> so according to me, tomorrow's design education would have to be something like sometimes you conduct an orchestra and sometimes you conduct a jamming session. And students will have to be comfortable with both of these. So if you are visit, re, revisiting India report, one of the aspects that you would look at is the modern design process, which is something quite different than what I, I think. Uh, uh, I, I would personally feel that we should consider that uh, Education Ministry has decided to close all the design schools, and now there is a mandate to start something new. What would that school be? And that would be something quite different than what is existed now, because the existing thing has evolved over a period, and it has its own baggage. So how would we conceptualize a new school? A few things that I could probably add is that we should explore uh, teach, uh, a teaching hospital as a metaphor for design schools, uh, which, should also be, which has hands-on project, which has field experience, which has theory built into it. We should also look at joint faculty appointment between departments so that interdisciplinary work is far better. And one probably one semester where people from engineering, people from design, people from management work together in a field to solve a problem, and also research into managing of multidisciplinary teams, particularly not co-located. Okay, this is uh, roughly uh, this is what I had uh, to say. Thank you.
will now take the opportunity here to one on behalf of the Ministry of Human Resources Development welcome all the participants and so as a participant in this design dialogue to welcome Dr. Palam Raju, Minister for Human Resources Development. Thank you very much for being with us here, sir. So instead of the traditional flowers, we actually had the best speakers and best thinkers here to greet you. So, and also to welcome Shri Ashok Thakur, the Secretary for the Higher Education Department. I also want to say here that uh, this design workshop would not be possible were it not the fact that the Minister and the Secretary both really embody what we mean by design thinking. They really both embody the possibility of creative freedom with purposiveness driven by a concern for human good. So that's the real driving force why we've actually tried to transgress traditional partnerships, got this room full of very different people, ranging from very different ends on the spectrum. And despite the very plural epistemies and definitions of design that everybody brings to bearing here, is to try to see how we can transform and create integrated cognitive processes which can be embedded in institutional mechanisms in educational institutions. The point that my colleagues made about design and education is a real concern here. And that's what we hope to be able to drive. And some of the steps would be how, the goal would be how do we create and transform the education processes and at least higher, edu higher and educational institutions where there is capability and there are resources so that you create design heads actually. Design heads that are capable of doing functional analytics, aesthetics and ethics together and that's the real design head that we're looking at. If that's the goal then how do you create what kind of steps will this workshop stimulate right now building on all the thought that has come before. Lalaji wrote a very nice mail saying, what about the thinking that's gone before? And I think it's very pertinent. And how do we look at all the dialogue before? And then how do we build on that? And the steps we, which I suggest here, and we could have more of that as we go on, sir, is one to look at uh, how do we sustain these kind of relationships and institutional mechanisms that can be resource support seeded by the ministry and other uh, domain partners in the institutions whose heads are here with us and whose uh, faculty is here with us. And if you can do that, then perhaps we can look for a kind of a thinking group and a virtual network, virtual group that can try, try creating a design education manifesto. And that design education manifesto could then either try to create design schools in the institutions, can also be ways in which design thinking can pervade existing curriculum and pedagogic processes. So this is how we open up the skies for discussion on institutionalizing a new kind of design education in our institutions. So, so that's a very clear goal. So we have a lot of freedom and creative play in thinking our way through it. You must have focus and priorities and where we want to be, uh, define a destination. So. so with these welcoming words, and I'd like now like to invite uh, Lele Tayabji, a legend in herself, who's worked for Dastakar, who probably embodies all these notions of design, product, process, policy, transformative leadership, and of course, human communities, building human life. Now, Leshi. A recent book, a proposed book by Divya Patil, which I would just send to you, part of a proposed exhibition at the VNA in London next year, puts contemporary Indian design fashion, interiors, graphic communication into a neat, colorful box, all ordered and arranged in sequence. Of course, Indian design, like Indian life, isn't like that. India is a huge, messy, chaotic, multi-layered country with everything going on at different tangents. No sooner do you come to one conclusion than you discover something that completely contradicts it. For example, just as you conclude that traditional Indian design is all about color and ornamentation and excess, you encounter Kerala and the austere monotones of its off-white textiles edged with gold, and the flowing, simple, shallow lines of its oolies. You decide that Indian motives are all floral jars, butas, and interlocking lines, and you are reminded of the black and white and red dramatic stripes of Naga shores and the checkered patterning of irical weaves. Men weave and women embroider in Kashmir, men, the men embroider, and in Assam, the women weave, and so on and on. Another almost universally accepted truism is that design is the diametric opposite of science, a rather frivolous fringe activity fit only for girls looking for husbands. 
parents urging their sons to go into engineering or medicine shudder at the thought of fashion or that he might opt to be that effete object, a designer. It escapes the average layman that every surgical instrument and piece of medical equipment needs to be designed in order to fulfill its function and that engineering and design are practically twin brothers. For the layman, design means surface ornamentation, making things look pretty. Wrong, wrong. I think it was Steve Jobs who said, design is not just what it looks like and feels like, design is how it works. Then you come to craft. People in my sector are divided into purists who think that Indian craft is a sacred stream that has never deviated from its Vedic roots, despite an occasional twist or buffet, thanks to the influence of the Mughals or British, and who shudder that, the, that modern designers, by turning tradition into market-led product, are polluting that poor stream, pure stream. The other lobby feels that Indian craft is static, boring, and repetitive, and that only the injection of contemporary art school-led Western design can transform it into something relevant. Both schools ignore the fact that craft has always been a market-led activity that evolves and adapts itself with the lifestyles, needs, and demands of its consumers. We may think that all kachi embroidery is the same generic mirror work, but actually, every one of the half dozen tribal communities in that area has its own distinctive motive and stitch directory. A, rab a rabari embroiderer can date a piece within a decade by the colors, motives, and placement, and the raw materials available at that time. The dilemma today is not that craftspeople do not want to respond to new trends, but that they are distanced from their end user in ways that were never the case before. Therefore, they find it difficult to understand and keep up with the pace of change. And urban designers are similarly distanced from the craft tradition, a divide that both technology and urban design can bridge. Similarly, the choice is not an either or of technology or handcraft. Each has its place and purpose, and a linking of both would create an exciting and necessary dynamic. These days, a huge debate is on regarding power loom versus hand loom, with many movers and shakers, including bureaucrats and politicians, affirming that hand loom is irrelevant and dead, a sunset industry, as one very senior bureaucrat said to me recently. A fact, by the way, not validated by any market survey. In actual fact, sales of the handicraft and handloom sector increase by 18 to 20 percent each year. It is a niche market, but it's a growing one, internationally as well as nationally. So rather than throw away handloom, and with them the countless amazing textiles and motives that the far loom can never replicate, let's apply technology and all those brilliant young IIT minds on working on the structure and processes of the handloom and see in what way it can be adapted and made less labor intensive while retaining its inherent strengths. A weaver in Kanchipuram has just won an award, in fact, for adapting his loom so he can operate it single-handedly rather than requiring an additional trained apprentice. I can think of dozens of other craft processes from dhokra metal casting to lark bangle making where little science would ease the lives of these fantastic creative artists and give them the space to innovate and explore. This goes from processing of raw material to developing appropriate packaging for the finished product. We are fortunate in India to have both living traditional craftspeople with extraordinary hand skills, as well as scientists and technocrats capable of sending satellites into space. Both sectors have some of the liveliest minds and talents. Alas, the two seldom meet. Design, craft, and fashion are customarily seen as soft disciplines, science and technology as, half, as tough. In fact, like a man and a woman, a partnership between the two results in a powerful creative energy. We need to unbox the assets, attributes, and professional skills 
in each of these sectors, sharing knowledge, awareness, and skill sets, creating a unique synergy and potential, and enriching our wonderful country in the process. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leto. Now, may I now ask uh, Professor Karthik Ramani from Purdue University to make a presentation in the shape of design? the uh, status quo in our in our educational systems and uh, in, in these types of uh, environments uh, and educational processes develop uh, in very very structured ways however in the emerging scenario a lot of our assumptions that we based our educational models are not valid anymore a lot of the explicit knowledge is taught in courses in uh, fluid mechanics and structures and uh, and, and many other uh, uh, contexts that type of explicit knowledge has less and less value now Whereas a lot of design has to be experienced and a lot of the implicit processes cannot be taught in online courses. You cannot videotape and put it on, on uh, online uh, uh, media and uh, have one listen to that and, and go through procedures to learn it. So in this form of an implicit, hands-on, experiential, and creative uh, process, it's a contact sport. Uh, it is not something that, uh, that can be imparted in traditional ways. It has to be learned and it cannot be taught. So this emergent uh, form of learning, uh, which we are calling the front end of design, design thinking, is, uh, uh, is more an explorative process. It's, uh, it's more contextualized in asking the right questions. But in order to experience it, as, as I was suggesting, my, uh, uh, and, and one of the things that I want, to, I want to propose is one of play and imagination. And, and uh, over the past 18 years, I have been um, uh, developing and uh, with changes in technology and so on, developed uh, an environment where students actually learn design thinking uh, using uh, both uh, existing uh, evolved technology, but also more focused towards creative processes, uh, sketching, uh, and uh, uh, understanding play, uh, and, and con uh, concept development, and so on. But uh, the, the emergent processes which we are seeing technology influence is, is a parallel process, and we decouple the two, primarily because computer-aided processes and other processes uh, do not uh, necessarily allow you to explore. You can uh, make a quick sketch, tear the paper, and throw it without any training or learning. Uh, whereas, if you if you create uh, existing uh, use traditional media like computers to create uh, designs, you don't explore. And so we decouple the two, yet have the students experience a creative process which uh, leads to imagination and and uh, uh, invigorates them, invigorates their thinking, invigorates uh, the way they they think, and and uh, uh, and and changes the way that uh, the design design emerges. We have a series of workshops uh, that uh, uh, allow people to work in teams, uh, co-create, uh, converse, and, and they learn uh, existing forms of play. They take traditional toys and play with them. And then we, we contextualize it with changing play value. They change the play value and, and learn how to think about uh, and, and try to become uh, the young person that they were uh, in terms of creating, uh, creating uh, toys uh, that people can enjoy playing. Uh, and it also allows you to explore in uh, an iterative process, which, uh, uh, which encompasses both uh, play, but also hardware and software. Uh, and all these are, are uh, emergent forms of, uh, forms of design. Modern products have, have uh, and will continue to have more of uh, software, 
uh, as well as hardware and electronics and sensors. But uh, in order to create these new kinds of designs, uh, one has to one has to have a, a environment which is bounded, but yet uh, explorative in terms of uh, being able to uh, to create uh, new designs. So in terms of uh, uh, actually exploring this process, uh, we, we, we have developed a series of uh, sketching workshops. And part of uh, the sketching work workshops are to prevent uh, engineers from fixating. They, we want engineers to explore uh, quickly and explore in teams and be able to, uh, to create things. Uh, so we, we teach them a uh, lot of the uh, studio-based thinking and industrial design thinking, but uh, uh, in, in, a, in a way that, that uh, engineers don't think that they are artists. You know, a lot of engineers are inhibited towards sketching, uh, and, and they have been uh, too, uh, immersed in structured processes of education for too long. So we want to break that. So we have a lot of workshops to break their their barriers to, to sketching and externalizing their thinking. And also, it makes their cognitive processes evolve in, in new and creative ways. You can combine, change, morph, uh, and, and work in teams to, to, um, uh, to, to explore a lot of, uh, lot of uh, different concepts. And in this emergent uh, design processes, uh, the, the uh, way in which teams work is, is, uh, is quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, here are some uh, examples of uh, various types of toys uh, students have created. Uh, one of them here is, a, is an internet-based uh, toy. It actually lifts weight uh, based on stock prices. It, uh, it, you know, the person actually starts lifting weight when stock prices go up and so on. Uh, but also, uh, here is another one which, uh, which actually uh, was, was a very interesting design using very low-cost controllers, $15 and so on, sensors. But basically, it's, it's a, a graveyard consisting of, uh, of uh, uh, zombies, and students actually created an iPhone uh, control toy which can uh, um, which can shoot the zombies down and explore a very creative form of play um, during during the, the semester. So here are some other uh, features uh, in terms of uh, the sketching and thinking that uh, allows people to externalize thought and motion and size and scale, uh, as well as a lot of the operations that uh, allow one to uh, think. A lot of uh, students have great difficulty in thinking from an empty slate. If you give them a blank sheet of paper and ask them to come up with concepts, it becomes very hard for them. So we wanted to break that uh, types of processes. But also, um, it, uh, as, as I was suggesting, it allows one to explore uh, in, in, the, uh, in the workshops, uh, in the paddle stream, to more traditional hands-on uh, computer-based processes. They are exploring various, uh, various things. Uh, and, and in these series of workshops, create a lot of concepts and then reduce it and finally design and build uh, uh, fairly complex toys, uh, as, as I was uh, suggesting earlier. And uh, in, in doing so, um, we, we uh, come up with uh, very uh, interesting, uh, interesting toy scenarios. They go through a couple of cycles of prototyping, and this has changed over the years. And uh, with technologies such as 3D printing, we are able to explore uh, uh, very rapidly with very low-cost printers. And, and uh, some of the ones that have come out in the last one year cost uh, less than $200. And with 3D printing, one can create fairly complex uh, designs, which are not bound by previous manufacturing processes. Complexity comes at zero cost now. And you don't have to design features for traditional manufacturing processes. And one can, uh, one can actually break a lot of uh, aspects in, in, in terms of uh, making things. And traditionally, manufacturing has constrained uh, a designer. But now, uh, certainly, we find that you can print very complex things, but design tools have not yet caught up to this. And in my opinion, this is one of the first times in history that uh, our ability to make things uh, via printing, for instance, has surpassed our ability to create uh, very interesting features. Um, some more examples, uh, and, and in our courses, we want students to bring together some of the traditional disciplines of, of uh, engineering, but uh, put it together and synthesize them in, in creative ways. And I was uh, suggesting earlier how engineering has been taught in the past uh, is creating silos of knowledge, and not in a bad way. You need silos for specialization. But what we are faced with now is our ability to, to uh, cut across these silos and explore uh, designs in, in fairly creative ways. Uh, so it's not an either-or situation, but actually in merging the two disciplines, and as all of you know, as institutional leaders, it's very hard to bring the people that, uh, that have, have, uh, uh, have experienced uh, uh, educational models in, in this setting, and we ourselves have experienced it in this setting, to start working towards educating students in a very different uh, emergent uh, world. So with that, I would like to uh, uh, end. And uh, the key here is, uh, as I was suggesting, is to marry both the structure from traditional sciences and engineering to, together with more uh, playful and creative forms uh, in a new, new form, a uh, new culture of design learning. 
one that is more experiential, more collaborative, and focuses more on uh, reflection, abstraction, as well as uh, learning through doing and making. So thank you very much. So uh, Mary Plus Professor Anthea Ranjan from Iradi to Extension. Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> yeah, so we'll uh, get to the slides. I've uh, titled it Call for a New Vision. And I would like to first thank Professor Atwankar for his lucid uh, statement. I think half my job is done by the claims that he has made and the definitions that he's given to design. He's brought in the platform. And I would also like to th thank Laila here for looking at another sector which also needs design. So I just want to catch up in this uh, slide that where are we today? We're 60 years on uh, from the setting up of the National Institute of Design. Professor Atwankar talked about the India report which, had a, which started even earlier. And we are now at the cusp of a new transition. And I think the time is right and we need to move forward. So you'll see certain statements there. We are at 2013 and 2014 I've set a red mark over there saying calling it Ministry of Design. Is this a big call? Is it a strange call? Because every ministry in this country needs design and they do not know it. Why do I say they do not know it? They're using it. All of us have an idea of design which is different and we need to now merge it together to find out one cohesive idea. It will not be a single idea. It will be a multiple idea. So what is this design thing that I'm talking about? And if you really look back at the history of design, my definition of design begins two million years ago with the first use of fire. It's an intentional leap of faith which performed something for us. So intentions that bring value, it puts everything that we make and do under this definition. Now, if that is true, then it takes a long time for us to understand what we have done. And this is where, so we put design first, then it becomes a fine art, it becomes we perfect it, and then we build the knowledge for it, which is the sciences. But I think as we go forward, we put the cart before the horse, and in, in our country at least, we know the numbers tell us that science and technology proceeds, art follows, and design trails far behind. Do we need to change and bring, the, unless it's of course, you know, there are planes which are propelled from behind, we can continue to put the cart before the horse, but I think that way is not the way we need to go. These are three legs of a society to be able to build. Bo all three are required and essential, but we need to, when I say misplaced priorities, we need to share it and see that the uh, weight of the legs, to use a metaphor, which we keep using. Now, what are the needs of India? We have actually listed 230 sectors of our economy that need design. And I like the idea of the hospital approach. We need perhaps 230 hospitals and 230 kinds of things. Who is doing design for the agricultural sector? Are the agricultural universities doing it? Or is it happening somewhere else? Or is it happening in the field or in the breach between the gaps? How much do we need and in what areas? And I think we need to look at it. There are 600 cultural clusters that we belong to. We call ourselves a nation, but we have mapped out in our book Aditya and I, with a team of what, 50 teams, we worked and mapped out 600 clusters of handicrafts in the country. These are just metal objects from one kind of production space. But there are 500 materials, there are 600, ex I think. Look at the idea that, um, without looking at craft, look at food, for instance. How many pickles do you know? And just take mango pickles. The variety is staggering. And I think that is something brings water to our mouth. Why does it do so? It is because we have perfected an art of converting a certain kind of food into a way of eating. And that way of eating is forming culture. I think that's what we need to understand. And to that we add the complexity of multiple linguistic zones and multiple regional aspirations. Everybody is not thinking alike. They have different, I, I think Laila touched upon Kerala being white. I'm a Malayali, but that's not why I'm wearing white, but you know, I, I'm not ashamed of being a Malayali. Although I lived 40 years plus in Gujarat, I'm also an Ahmedabadi. So I know the money bit and, you know, things like that. So what is this design? I have two points over here. 
which is nature of design and areas of application. There are, there is a nature to design. And uh, by the way, this presentation is available online and you can download it from my blog. But there are four notions of the words in blue that I'd like to draw your attention to. These are terminologies that I've uh, adopted from uh, Professor Harold Nelson and their book, The Design Way. I'm coming to him later. Intentions, because we need to set goals and directions. We need to build explorations into it. Because somehow we start with the tendering process. And that is wrong. Because you cannot tender something you do not know. Which is what we are trying to do. We are building a future by tendering. That means we hope that some entrepreneur on the corner will create that answer for you. Wrong, sir. It's not going to happen. We've got to invest in the future. We've got to invest in explorations. We've got to invest in compositions, which means we've got to try it out, play around, work, and then pass it on to the tendering system of what we like and what we want. Once we wins. So it is not about uh, right and wrong. It's about better and worse. Atwankar told it already. And I think this is really where we need to build. How do you build that into education now? What are the metaphors of design? And why is design so difficult to understand? <clears throat> I, I use a number of metaphors. Nature of design tells us fire, seed, iceberg. What are these metaphors? Fire is actually a system. It interacts with the environment, converts material, generates energy, does all these things, but it works as an integral system. You can't make an object and think that it solved the problem. So the object has to be used. It is used in a context. You go outside Delhi, you go outside Ahmedabad, you will find humongous mountains of objects which is disposed by the city corporation. Noida has one which is, I don't know, 10, 10 stories, 20 stories, 30 stories tall. Ahmedabad has one. Every city has one. So why are we making more objects? Big question. Why do we need so many cars? Why is growth so important? Some of these questions come up. Seed. The potency of a seed, you cannot see in the seed the forest. That is what the design has. And the iceberg means that everything is not visible. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So I think we need to understand it. And the ways of design, design is a process. We have models for processes. We need to recognize that. Design is a journey, individual and team journeys. And design is also several styles of thinking put together. I have a model. These are all my models which I use. <coughs> and the domains of design are many. Therefore, it's even more confusing. But these images that I've used here are from a poster that we prepared for the Davos meet in 2009 as case studies for corporate leaders to look at, to see where design could be used. Thank you. <coughs> Objects, communications. Now, that said six minutes, so I still have two. <laughs> so we will go. And then these are the thought leaders that we need to draw attention to. These are not all, but there are some who are restating and redefining. The reason why I put them up over here is that there are books available and all of you can get your whole uh, hands on them. And there's also things which are happening on the web, not only in the book space, which are, and they're talking about, uh, you know, co-creation, sense-making, and processes of that kind. Now, the core area is design education. just in time sir basic design and project learning these are two pronged approach I don't want to complicate the matter so design education is possible and this is drawn from uh, something which has refreshingly happened in 1950s to 60s there was a school that was built after the Bauhaus I don't think Bauhaus the Bauhaus gave us the foundation program but the Hochschule uh, Gestalt in Ulm gave us the basic design program which is sensitizing designers to be able to do compositions and judgments. And if you are interested, that uh, the, the material is available here, and you can catch up on that. So what is basic design as different from foundation? It is sensitization, uh, empowering, enabling, and envisioning as an ability, which is a core design ability. And then the contextualization is the project learning that can be done. And it needs to be done rooted in the place where you are and we'll move forward from there. So we have examples, and we have many what-ifs. What if there were sector-specific schools? What if there were 
you know, design was inside, sprinkled inside the university, how would it change the nature of the university and so on? How do you put it into management schools? I think that we have already had. And we have experiences with that. Some of my students got involved with the Apple project in the 90s. And we have also had some experience building such alternate institutions. For Bamboo, for instance, we built one in Agartala to try and find out. And it's wonderful learning experiences which are there. We're also thinking, what if we are able to give this kind of learning to IAS officers at their, and imagine the probationers going out and doing transformational roles in their first placement, with some funding, of course. And there are case material which has happened. You know, design for change is a children transforming exercise, which is happening. One million kids are involved today. Daily dump is dealing with that garbage problem. You don't need a garbage dump. You can compost at home. And there are such examples which are there. It's not only designers who are doing it, citizens who are doing design. Uh, Sulab Sauchalia, Arvind Netralia, Lijat Papad are all design solutions in our context, in our time. And I think we need strategies to nurture professions, education, research, scholarship, policy, and awareness, because all of this is important. And public good is something that is almost not addressed. And I think this is where the question comes, where should design be located? Should, today, it is in DIPP, it's in MHRD, it's in many places, but this is where the question comes up, do we need a ministry? Wicked problems we mentioned, and it needs strategies of its own kind. And finally, I believe that we have come to a cusp where we need to look at new visions, new ways of defining, and hopefully, this will be a call that uh, will be heard well beyond this room. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, Professor uh, Ranjan. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. San Petrodo, renowned innovative design thinker, sir. And uh, to, without much ado, may I request Sri Ashok Thakur now, sir? Could you address? Thank you, Amita. <clears throat> In fact, uh, it's a great opportunity for our ministry to hold such a workshop in which I see people from various uh, backgrounds, whether they are from the IITs, IIMs, our sc uh, School of Planning and Architecture, NIDs, in fact, from all sorts of institutions. And I think that is the message uh, that this particular workshop is going to con uh, convey that we, we forget to which organization or which discipline we belong to. We have to put everything together for the cause of creativity. I think that is the message. I don't have much to say, but uh, uh, I'm basically come here very curious to listen to all of you and, uh, and imbibe things into uh, our ministry's way of thinking. Uh, the only thing which I would like to say at this stage is that uh, uh, when we think about designing, we think only about engineering designing. We have um, some institutions in our MH MHRD, uh, basically triple uh, ITs on design and manufacturing. Our thinking stops there. We don't really venture out. So this kind of thing will uh, stretch it across and then uh, we think that uh, uh, it is beyond engineering and it is in fact uh, creative designing. So. Uh, let's uh, hope and see how we go further. I feel that aesthetics is a very important component. Though traditionally our country, uh, our country is known for its aesthetics, but somehow of late, um, I think uh, aesthetics is something which has just gone out of our uh, vision. I think that is something which is very, very important to blend aesthetics into everything. One little example which comes to my mind is the, um, which I often think, personally is that uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, MNRE gives tons of money to everybody to set up solar heating devices. They're very useful, but they're so ugly. So let's do something about that, for example. Uh, so with that thought, I once again, I don't have much to say, but I'd like to learn a lot from you. Thank you very much. And I welcome uh, Mr. Sam Petroda, uh, and, uh, because he has been really after us trying to set it on, on, on this path. And sir, I'm today very glad that you would also be uh, pleased that we are trying to uh, understand what you have been trying to tell us in the last five, six years. Thank you very much. Okay.
thank you, sir. Without your inspiration, we would not be doing design thinking. You give us the freedom to do that. May I request our guest of honor, Sri San Petrona, now to uh, so kindly address. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I firmly believe that design can transform quality of life in India in a significant way. I believe design is a platform and not just a subject. It's a way of life. It requires ecosystem, change in mindset, and it has far-reaching implications on everything we do. We have had some great traditions in design. When I look at Indian jewelry, when I look at Indian temples, Taj Mahal, even what we do with potato in India, I think a lot of credit goes to our design talent. I tell a lot of my European colleagues that your idea of potato eating is boil it or smash it. And Indians probably have 100 different ways of eating potato. And that's the Indian creativity. But somehow we don't get credit for it. I think in the last 50 years, we have really not paid enough attention to design, innovation, creativity. Today, this government is really committed and doing some very interesting things, but we don't get credit for it. For example, right to information is a very creative idea for Indian democracy at this point in time in the history. So we have right to information, but we don't have information organized in the manner people need. Similarly, we have created right to education, Narega, food security. These are some big ideas which require a lot of design in back of it to deliver. So we have this idea called RTI, but there is no design in place for RTI to deliver to people transparency, accountability, and all of that. This government also decided to put together a knowledge commission eight years ago to really look at the aspects of knowledge institutions and infrastructure that India would need in the 21st century. We had some great ideas, a lot of these ideas in the system. We are working through it, and design was one of the elements there. Then we took knowledge network to connect all our education institutions, R&D institutions, with 1,500 nodes to connect 40 gigabit bandwidth to really improve collaboration, share resources, knowing that all research today requires great deal of collaboration, happening faster than ever before, and is multidisciplinary. This network is already built, working, but we really don't know how to use it. You have great resource, but very few people really use it. I would like design to be the core of that network. Can we really create multiple institutions of design and connect them? So there is a group of people working on design for the government, design for agriculture, design for health, design for education, design for textile. And there are hundreds of subjects. On one hand, you need verticals. On the other hand, you need a horizontal. And we need to do both of those things simultaneously. So we have talked about using NKN to really build design capabilities. In addition, we are now building a network to connect 250,000 local panchayats to optical fiber. So then you'll be able to see design at the local level. These two networks are going to cost us about $10 billion. In addition, we are creating platforms like UID that Nandan Dilkan is working on, GIS platform that Dr. Kasturi Rangan and Dr. Swami are pushing, then application platform. So when you put all of this together, government is spending about 100,000 crores on creating this new 
infrastructure. How can design people use this infrastructure and not think of design in the old paradigm where there is a physical design school? I think you've got to look at design in light of the new paradigm, which is networking, hundreds of gigabits of bandwidth available, and access to everybody. This is happening in India. It will happen in the next few years. But I don't think our people really get it. Sometimes it is helpful that they don't get it. So you can get it done before they get it. But I tell you, this government is really pushing very hard on a lot of innovative ideas. The fact that we declared 2010, 2020 as the decade of innovation itself is an accomplishment. For a nation of this size to say we will have a decade of innovation and we'll push innovation for next 10 years is a great accomplishment. The question is, what do we all do with it? How do we capitalize on it? And how do we really push our ambitions forward? Like this evening, there is a meeting of 120 all over the world, Indian ambassadors. And I'm getting an opportunity to talk about the role of innovation in our foreign policy. Nobody had ever thought of it. U.S. has used higher education as an instrument of foreign policy for the last 50 years. Every finance minister in Latin America has gone to school at University of Chicago. Can we in India really use design and innovation as an instrument of foreign policy also? These are all the challenges ahead of us. I feel very good that we are all here to talk about it. Some of my friends here have been pushing this for last couple of decades. I'm glad that Minister and Secretary has taken interest in this subject. And I hope in the next few years, we can launch hundreds of design institutions. This country of 1.2 billion can't have 5, 10, 20 design institutions. Design has to be part of the culture. It has to be taught in school. And it has to be everywhere. It has to be pervasive. And I think it's about time that we put all our brains together to use the network, look at new technology, and really be creative and innovative in creating design solutions and not go back to the traditional approach. This whole idea of physical infrastructure doesn't make sense anymore. It has to be all virtual infrastructure. No need to build buildings, get 20 acre land, build a campus, and then have no content. And that's what we have been doing in the past. You know, today when you tell somebody you want to build a university, immediately they would say, I need 250 acre land. And I tell them, you can have classes at railway stations, bus stands, shopping centers, Starbucks, restaurants. You really don't need physical space. This is pushing one side. But it is possible today to link and there is no issue today in terms of brain drain. It is all about brain chain. So design is a classical way of chaining all our design brains together in the country and build awareness, institutions, infrastructure, and ultimately improve productivity, efficiency, reduce cost, create employment, and really focus on Indian needs, which is inclusive growth, Indian model of development, I don't think Western model of development is going to deliver the results we need. You know, everyone is following U.S. model of development, which is based on consumption, which I believe is not scalable, sustainable, desirable, workable in India. We need our own model. India is too big to have somebody else's model. And we have our model. In Gandhian thinking, in terms of rural development, decentralization, Frugal innovations, you know, low cost, affordability, scalability, <laughs> sustainability, all of these are standard Indian ideas. We have been at it for a long time. Can we revive it and not look to West for design solutions, but look inside? With this, once again, I want to thank Honorable Minister, Secretary and others for giving me this opportunity.
and I'm delighted to be part of this. I'm convinced that this is the way to do it. I've been on the board of Design Institute in Chicago, Institute of Design. And about six years ago, I told Patrick Whitney, who is the head, I said, Patrick, have you ever designed slums? And he said, what do you mean? I said, have you been to India? He said, no. I said, why should go to India? So we sent him to India with six students. They went to Dharavi. They spent a week at Dharavi. And every day they will call me in Chicago and they said, look, this is a gold mine for design PhDs. He said, we have no idea that this place is dying for new design solutions. He said, we are just studying how water gets into Dharavi and how people store water. Itself is a design challenge. Now, why, why don't we in India look at it? How food gets into Dharavi? How jobs are created in Dharavi? How Dharavi people find jobs? Unfortunately, when you get a degree in design, you want to, wo you want to work for Cartier. You want to work for Louis Vuitton. But you don't want to design better slums. I think that's the challenge in India. I have said time and time again, best brains in the world are busy solving problems of the rich who really don't have problems to solve. As a result, problems of the poor don't get the right kind of talent. <laughs> India needs the best design talents to solve the problems of the poor. Thank you. So for a very inspiring and a very pertinent uh, address. So that's the right thoughts to be put on the table. And may I now request uh, our Minister for Human Resource Development, Dr. Panam Raju, to give his address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sam Petroda and uh, all the participants from different professions who made themselves available to participate in this workshop, which is, uh, as you would have seen the notes, has no clear defined agenda, but to apply our minds together on uh, design, rethinking design, and how do we come up with uh, methodologies towards addressing the, uh, the numerous issues that we have in the country, and also to evolve a new way of uh, looking at design. And I would thank you all for your time and your participation. I'd also like to compliment the ministry, especially Shri Ashok Thakur and Amita Sharma, who have been, uh, you know, applying their mind and, you know, how do we get all our talented people together towards uh, applying their mind uh, to this aspect of design. Mr. Sam Petroda has given a very, very enlightening address. A man who always thinks out of the box, who looks ahead, and I'm glad that uh, his uh, presence has made such a big difference today. I am going through a very uh, different way of working myself. Uh, in reality, I have quit being a minister. I have submitted my resignation to the Prime Minister, which he, he, uh, he hasn't accepted. It's been over a month. And uh, so I've found a new way of working. I work out of home now. I have flexible timings. I, <laughs> I handle only what I want to handle. So I stopped applying my mind on policy. I leave it to Mr. Thakur. <laughs> and uh, I look at only the files that I want to. And I attend the seminars that I feel that are productive to me. So I have that luxury of having resigned and not yet out of a job. So that is... Uh, given me time to apply my thought in a lot of ways and uh, I feel uh, the country is going through such a important transition that all of us, it is important for all of us who are in uh, some positions to apply our mind and to make a difference, to really apply our mind and, you know, for the future of the country. Like uh, Professor Ramani has pointed out, I think there's wonderful work happening in this country in various spheres, but it's all happening in silos. And it is important to connect these silos. And I think uh, definitely design is an important part of uh, applying all this knowledge. 
one of my uh, areas where I worked hard is uh, you know physical design of uh, chips. So one of the most complex processes that you would see where uh, you are putting together millions of transistors on a piece of silicon and uh, the desired output is left to the designer. It can be a communication chip, it can be a storage chip, it can be a multifunctionality chip. It depends on the functionality and the output you need out of the chip. And we've used a lot of uh, software tools. You, do, you apply your knowledge of engineering design, you apply your knowledge of uh, electronics, and that is how the output is designed. In a similar fashion, I think we have to apply our minds. I mean, that's each of these uh, transistors and the combination of these transistors determines the functionality that you desire out of the chip. In a similar way, I think we have to apply our minds together in terms of finding optimal solutions to the numerous issues that are there. And when you think of design, like Mr. Ashok Thakur said, you know, you either think it's engineering design or you think fashion technology. So I think we have to get out of that mindset and say that design is something much, much more. And uh, that's why we are all here. We are people from diverse backgrounds and diverse disciplines. And uh, how do we apply all our knowledge and experience towards evolving processes, evolving methodologies, designing products that are going to make a qualitative difference in the lives of all our uh, citizens and also make an impact on the world. And uh, I don't want to talk further and exhibit my ignorance on design. And uh, I would like to all of you to contribute to the uh, workshop today. And uh, this is only a first step. And I hope that uh, this exercise would be sustained towards uh, you know evolving something much more concrete and for the evolution of schools of design in each of our institutions which will be the torchbearers and the, uh, the, the focal points for our uh, collaboration across various disciplines towards coming, coming out with some meaningful solutions in the coming years. So I would like to close my address by thanking each one of you again. Jai Hind. So thank you very much. I think we've got a fair amount of issues now on the table which have come about inclusive design, frugal, and creative economies, Indian way of thinking. So all the right terms are now here. And we have all the right minds now, I think, on more or less the same page. So we open this house up now for a Q&A session with San Petroda and with the minister and with each other. So who would like to take the first question? We could, so would you like to, Mr. so would you like to start off with making some observation or would you wait for someone? So somebody could raise a hand, and the other request is to keep the question brief so that there's time for enough questions and for answers. And you could raise your hand like the like straight here. Yeah, so thank you for, uh, for your nice uh, talk. Uh, my question is uh, really related to, uh, to something that you alluded to that, uh, for instance, um, uh, Ashok Gadgil from UC Berkeley uh, worked on the Dafur stove and removing of arsenic from water and so on. There are so many rich problems in India. And you pointed out this very nice uh, wicked design problem in Dharavi. Why aren't people in India addressing these problems? Are there enough incentive structures among academics to actually tackle these wicked problems? I'm sure everybody here in this room is aligned and a believer in this setting, but um, it's not that pervasive as we would like. I think we spend very little time, personally, I believe, on new frontiers, except if you're really good scientist working on astrophysics and all that, that's great. Okay. We're really not focused on solving day-to-day -day problems. Somehow it is not encouraged. And I'm sure a lot of my colleagues will not agree with me. You know. But the question is, why aren't they solving the Ravi problem? Absolutely. Why isn't IIT Mumbai doing it? I agree with you, but they don't do it. Because it's not paying. They also believe that the best brain should work on the problems of the rich. So you get a degree in electrical engineering, you get a degree in economics, and you go work for a Goldman Sachs or some other investment bank you know, because they pay a hell of a lot of money. This is a challenge. You know. 
I agree. It's a big challenge. That's it. Uh, thank you for very inspiring thoughts from all of you. I mean, this is really very encouraging to find a multidisciplinary set of intellectuals here. Uh, I was just ruminating over all that uh, you said. And it occurs to me that this is actually a organizational design problem. The reason I say that is that right now we are a temporary organization. We've come together, we're going to spend a day. We are actually an organization functioning. Uh, genuinely, I think that people are ready to apply their minds. You know, if we are so inspired by a few minutes of conversation here, and we are ready to act, and there is no follow-up, I think basically it's about recognition of work. Work as recognized, which is being useful to your own profession, your own contribution. Contribution is, as you rightly said, contribution is not recognized in this country. Everybody is on a, a structure of saying, what is the answer? Therefore, I will go and search for a question. What is an outcome, right? So we always say, what is the outcome? What am I going to get out of this? And if our system does not capture contribution, effort, dedication, commitment, uh, one of the reasons why we don't make it as in the US they, they apply themselves is because there, there is no design for capturing contribution. And I think if, if we have all of you here. I wish it was that simple. First of all, I don't know the answer. But I must tell you, we are at a tipping point in this country. We are at a point where we are going to bring about generational change. We have been going on with the old model for too long. We need administrative reforms. We need judiciary reforms. We need political reforms. We need labor reforms. We need all kinds of reforms. Our labor laws don't meet today's needs. So how do we get all of these things going at the same time? And I believe technology will play an important role. Fortunately, today, we have access to information. We are democratizing information. Democratization of information would empower people. It has taken a long time. But today, you have possibility because of cloud computing, low-cost terminals, mobile connectivity. You know, we are a nation of a connected billion. It happened in the last 20 years. How do you use this connectivity going forward to redesign the nation? And that process is going on. And you see a lot of resistance from people. So what you see in the media is exactly opposite to what's really going on. Media is, you know, saying nothing got done. I think there is so much got done that everybody is worried. Okay, that's my theory. That now everybody is going to be exposed. And they are worried. Okay. So we are at a very critical point in the history. And I think that's a challenge for all of us. And there is a lot of talent. There are a lot of good people. There are a lot of committed people. You know, just unbelievable amount of talent in this country. And a lot of good talent. You know, you know I just wanted to follow up on the uh, uh, this discussion on arsenic as well as uh, dharavi. In fact, there are a lot of people in India working on many solutions for arsenic, and many have been found, And uh, but the problem is of scale. The same thing goes for Dharavi. I mean, I know many of my colleagues are working on several projects, ranging from malnutrition in children to, I think, Professor Atwankar is working on designs of houses and so forth. So there are many colleagues working. But the problem is of scale. How many people uh, uh, do we have? I mean, you add up all the faculty who are working in these areas, and they amount to a very small number. So it's really that uh, we have to multiply these efforts uh, hugely and uh, develop systems to translate some of these results uh, into practice. I find one thing which is missing in our society is the discipline. How do you inculcate discipline through, is it through education or it has to come from family? Because that is the primary thing which is, uh, in any design, you also need to have discipline. Uh, whether you learn discipline by designing or you start with discipline and then go for the design. 
think discipline is something you get very early in school or at home. You know, ultimately you need discipline, you need analysis, analytical capabilities, you need creativity to respect other people's viewpoint, and you need to be ethical. If you do these five things in school, you're okay. Education is all about these five things to me. You know, if you're not ethical and you graduate, what good is that? You know, and I think it's very fundamental in our society. Uh, uh, different schools and different fields here and one thing I would really love to happen I think at the end of this and all of us would like like to happen I'm sure is could we have a program uh, I mean could we have an educational program where all of us were contributing in some manner I think that would be wonderful thank you an option I would request you all to put together real content there is so much junk also on the net that it's very difficult to aggregate and filter. If this expertise can be used to really create good content for our students, put it on the net. I think that will be a great accomplishment. You know, maybe 100 different design courses on the net. That's where your talent is required. You know, then we'll learn to multiply, not that it's going to solve all the problems. But if every one of you can create some important content based on your lifetime of experiences, I think that will be a rich contribution. And if I can add, I'm, I'm just have a point here. Uh, at IDC and uh, uh, at the IIT Bombay, uh, we have uh, a lot of resources which have come up uh, uh, recently in the last two years. There's a resource called dsource.in. A lot of courses uh, are online, thanks to uh, Sam Patroda's meetings earlier. We've been now fully geared up for this activity. Most of the IITs, inclu including IIT Madras, has an NPTEL program. So uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, phenomenal, and we're also putting it on the NKN network. So in fact, uh, from next year onwards, we want to start a course where you could, your students could sit in their classes and listen live to the professors at IIT Bombay or at IIT Madras or any other IITs and NITs. Uh, and for that type of possibility is coming, and uh, I think uh, uh, we were uh, really gearing up for that. And that's what Mr. Sam Petrola has been mentioning about the NKN network, the National Knowledge Network. So this is, uh, we all have to uh, gear up for the projects. Why, why aren't you not? Uh, you, uh, in fact, uh, uh, they can uh, just apply to it to uh, the Chidambaram's office. Yeah. Right, yeah. and you'll get on it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, sir, okay. uh, uh, from IIT Kharagpur, uh, just picking up, we have just taken up this problem of designing the food security problem. So, and then uh, we are also looking at you know this right based. Once you have a right, therefore you must have a system in place and. Both education and uh, food security are two areas where a pan-IIT initiative needs to be taken up. And uh, there, you know, we want to look at this platform because scaling up, as Professor Kakkar said, just for us to do it, so the education must reach to that common man, as you said. They must know exactly how to be trained. So I think we need your support as well, you know, if we could, we could plan this out well, then this design and innovation for all these problems, we need to have a grand scale plan on the NKN platform to actually take it up. So I think if you uh, agree, then we will work it out and try to develop this scaling mechanism because just educating BTEX, MTEX is not sufficient to get to the scale of innovative design or even food security or, or any of these problems. So uh, I think we'll get there and we will continue to need your support. So if you have some quick suggestions to make at this point in time, uh, then uh, we would be very happy to hear that. The use of NKN is a big opportunity for all of us. But for that, you need interesting content. You know, and that content is not available anywhere. You know, I'm on the board at MIT on open course 
material. We have 2,200 courses at MIT. I've been working with them from day one. A lot of these courses are really good. We have our own courses. Can we take that and create good sort of content for Indian students? And really categorize and say, you need this to get to this content and all. I tell you, you will change Africa. Not only you will change India, if you do it right. Because everybody is looking at us. You know, we are the sort of IT power in this sort of, you know, developing world. We have the resources to do these kinds of things. Nobody else can do it. And there's a great way to really educate our own people. No? Yeah, Lela, you wanted to ask after. There's at a point in time where we are taking decisions and directions. And uh, you also sort of highlighted very major things that the current government has done and how it's always sort of viewed rather negatively. Uh, so what I'm going to say is that I think that one of the failures has been wonderful schemes, very sort of inclusive schemes and things, but what it really needs is an injection of commu designing the communications because people just don't know about it and by making them so boring and so sort of thing, you're leaving it open for attack. It has to be exciting, it has to be accessible, it has to be interesting and people must know. To put out a supplement in the paper with pictures of the ministers, however good looking they are, is not enough. You know, you have to actually tell the stories, you have to explain how people can access this and use it. Love to. Sir. Now I had one submission here because I think from my understanding of design, knowledge is important but it's not paramount. It is insights that are important and insights into what hasn't happened yet, not about what has happened. Because this is what will take us into the future. Now, I'm not sure whether the knowledge network is geared towards that kind of thing. Because here I find the real world is far superior to any library. I'm not dim dim uh, you know, diminishing the value of a library. I have a huge collection of books and I have a huge collection of online resources. But the real world, is what we have to focus on and we do not know yet how to connect with it. So the project learning approach which I'm suggesting and the basic design that I'm suggesting is that we look at how do we, for just a short example, we've taught design students business management by telling them to go outside the gate and look at the chaiwala. Within a week, they come back with all the terminology from procurement of uh, raw material to management people, strategies, etc. everything that you learn in a management school and then you codify it, but they do not know the terminology, but they do know the principles of everything that goes. Because a chaiwala on the street is equivalent to any big hotelier anywhere. He's serving the same, he's doing everything that they're doing. So I think, the, and in India, we are particularly uh, lucky to have the rural connect, the urban connect, and the richness of our content. Like you're saying, there's no content online, but the content is out there, we are not using it. We go into laboratories and start doing our research and education, when we are not using the field as a resource for learning. I think that's my plea. Sir, okay. uh, sir I am from School of Planning and Architecture, Bhopal. Very recently we have got a project uh, from, uh, which is JNNURM project uh, uh, review. And we, we are working for gas tragedy victims, their houses which have been made. In interestingly, we have seen that water supply schemes or their houses, etc., they have storage like what uh, all other people will, and they don't have money to buy storage probably for a day or maybe for more, not more than a week. So those people have given us so much of feedback. So what I want to say here is what Professor Ranjan was mentioning, that the kind of social opportunity our smaller towns do really present and we have technological opportunities, we can definitely provide them better solutions uh, with these projects like JN and URM, or for that matter, all those schemes which you have also mentioned. Thank you very much. I think we are talking more about the students and the courses. I, I think it's also very important with so many gurus here that we change the mindset of this generation first. Because, you know, that's where uh, there's a lot of uh, blockage, uh, not just with people in the room. But when you talk to people in our generation, 
we find that they're just not connected or not get, wanting to get connected. So I think that the online courses that you're talking about um, are also for a colonized psyche, for example, you know, how we accept anything that comes from outside, how everything here is, it doesn't work. I just have a comment to make on, a um, couple of comments to make. One is, uh, um, I think there is a big difference between the current generation and the previous generations. And the difference is in the kind of optimism that is there, out there, that we can actually make a difference to our lives. I, I think that's a huge, huge difference from the previous generations. And, and I think design is about change, changing for preferred, preferred situations. And therefore, it actually gels very well with, uh, as long as we are able to uh, give our students a sense of the fun excitement and the utility of design. I think you know, leaving all pedagogies apart, as long as we are able to give them a taste of design, it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, the rest we can put afterwards. So I think it's important that we find you know, design in every corner of the country, give everybody a taste of design. So that's the first point that I would like to make. The second point I would like to make is following what Professor Ranjan was saying earlier. You know, going back to Dharavi, you have given a very beautiful, it's a gold mine for problems, but I think it's also a gold mine for solutions. Because when you work under constraints, especially very hard constraints, we have to be creative in order to survive. And therefore, there are very interesting insights to solutions as to how people would survive under severe constraints. And I think the world, the way in which it is going, with greater population, lesser resources, and so on, we need to learn from how people live under less. So it is also a laboratory for finding solutions, not only problems. Thank you. Not uh, an expert in this at all, just a student of the subject. And uh, it's been very educative listening to all the experts on design. But I had just two questions. I don't know. Maybe uh, you can address them or uh, somebody else. One is, it's clear to me uh, just looking at uh, in the field of management various areas we think of design that mm -hmm. design permeates a lot of things uh, and just a quick set of uh, observations suggest I worry a little bit that once we acknowledge design permeates many things it shouldn't become a story of everything so like strategy is important in management we say so these days we have strategy for breakfast and strategy for meeting somebody so we should be careful, I think, in acknowledging the importance of design, but also sharpening clearly what do we mean when we say good design. And I think some elements such as dynamics of design, we're talking of design at micro, meso, macro level, you know, urban design, product design. So I think that's one thing I think we ought to, over time, it's great for us all to meet, but. I think sometimes it's good to bound big ideas, otherwise they become actually not big. Uh, so that's one thing I think I just quick uh, uh, listening to you, I was just thinking. The second thing, I know uh, big uh, movers and shakers and uh, significant people of authority are here. So I think people should think of how we can push this idea of design in our systems and uh, our institutions, I think that's a very laudable objective. But I think we should also think about how we can nurture an environment where people can be um, uh, creative and innovative. And so one can think of, uh, I think, design, uh, structured design, and it's very important. Complex problems require structured design. So we have, for example, in pharmaceuticals or chip design we were mentioning important to design from the top down, but equally important perhaps to nurture an environment where people will themselves design solutions and celebrate those. Sometimes, in fact, these things can be in conflict with one another. So I just wanted to, I was hoping that as we are talking about things, we no, don't just talk about how we create systems which are important, but also create an environment, a culture, where people who are finding and designing new solutions are able to enjoy the fruits of those both uh, economics. So I see no harm in people 
getting great rewards from wonderful design. Steve Jobs changed a lot of lives uh, everywhere in the world. I saw an iPad here. Uh, by, and and uh, on the other hand, uh, and economic is one, but also psychological, feeling a sense of creativity, sense of ownership, a sense of having done something. So I think if we can do both, it would be very nice. Well, uh, I, I would like to submit that uh, we need to have a fair amount of action to supplement all the philosophies and discussion we hold. Otherwise, we ourselves will tend to lose interest and others will lose faith on us. My little stint uh, between Kharagpur and Kanpur, about three years in CSIR, taught me that uh, there are opportunities available not just in one Dhara V or in one pocket of the country. The country is very large and also with a very large population. If you are well-meaning, there are opportunities for intervention and very effective intervention everywhere possible. Now, at Kanpur, we have identified a few such uh, places, for example, leather industry and the uh, local artisans in UP, where we think we should intervene, and our intervention can actually make them earn a little more. And since uh, UP alone accounts for about 45% of the total export in handicrafts, that will certainly make a large difference. So I would like to submit that maybe IITs and also other higher educational institutions can identify certain local areas whereby we can make ourselves more relevant. And if we can do some intervention by which the local artisans or uh, weavers or uh, craftsmen, if they can earn 10 or 15% more, that makes a huge difference to the national economy. And also, there's a dire need for us to intervene because of the pollution angles. Many of these people are unaware of uh, the various kinds of pollution they are creating and uh, are suffering also from that. So maybe minister can think of a scheme whereby every IIT, every university, or every higher education institute can submit a proposal and do a very uh, proactive, take a very proactive role in, in uh, translating our knowledge and percolating that to the poor around that can make a difference to their lives and overall to the country. Thank you. Scully, you want to say something? Yes. Um, uh, following the conversation uh, and uh, some of the points that Mr. Uh, Dr. Petroda raised about um, <coughs> models of growth and the, uh, the idea of uh, Dharavi, and uh, it was mentioned that Dharavi is a gold mine of, um, of problems and a gold mine of solutions. And even just the idea of a gold mine, a gold mine represents uh, a gold mine is a place where um, a wealth is gotten. And I think in listening to the conversation, one of the questions that I keep having is, what are the incentives or what are the institutions, if we're talking about design education, um, I think of the students, if we're talking about design education. The students who are being taught, what are their needs? Because that will end up showing us down the line what will be the fruit of the design education. I'm a, a visiting faculty at NID uh, for textiles. And I notice sometimes there's a big disconnect. There's a, a heavy weight uh, laid on the students for um, social uh, work or social intervention with craftspeople throughout the country. I'm passionate about uh, traditional crafts, handicrafts, textiles. But I come from a very practical uh, background. I think I was born to be a painter and a storyteller, but because I had to work to earn my daily bread, I ended up going into design, and I, I'm 
uh, in the odd place of representing business, <laughs> I guess, at this table, because I hear a lot of talk about the wonders of design and how they can um, solve problems. And I think we cannot forget about the incentive aspect, because unless you're talking about giant government programs, unless you're talking about giant institutes like the IITs going in and doing research and solving problems, then we're talking about private enterprise or some commercial aspect. I noticed when with my students at NID, um, they are all preoccupied with uh, Coco Chanel and Alexander McQueen and the problems of the rich. And I think when we talk about design, when we talk about, um, uh, Professor Ranjan spoke about even that these are, design is the building blocks of all of civilization, we have to in some way include in our conversation this idea of the incentive and maybe we have to bring some element into the education that merges some of the social issues and is there a different model of growth other than the American um, consumer type of wasteful um, uh, model? Is there? I don't know. But this element of incentive, what is going to drive, what organization are we talking about that this student is being trained to, what is the job they're going to occupy? Is it in a government institution? Is it to go into academia and then maybe uh, uh, train students to study and do a PhD products, ho uh, projects and, and um, um, uh, plans to, that will solve solutions? Or is it a commercial enterprise? And that's, that's what, what I keep asking myself here is, wh who is the student and what will they end up going out and doing after they leave school and I think that should inform how we teach them and when we when you talk about um, less infrastructure uh, and networking for me coming from the Fashion Institute of Technology and having sat on some of the initial committee meetings in New York when and NIFT is, was being um, set up here in India uh, one of the things that I always think is uh, a very, very powerful tool for social change is uh, very close relations between academic institutions and industry or commercial uh, enterprise because that's the reality of the world. And if we don't face the fact that the students do have to go out and earn a living and, and humans are uh, driven by these incentives of, of uh, improving their standards of living, how do we make that individual uh, incentive work for uh, uh, the volume of uh, the, the, the social needs that we have in India? If you wanted to ask in the request, you can keep the question very brief because uh, you've got small time. Uh, hello. I Dr. Sam Petra, I met you long back. We designed telephones for you when you were in CDAC, probably remember. Uh, now I want to raise a different issue altogether. For the last 12, 13 years, I've been working in bamboo sector. We designed products, we designed toolkits. Now we are doing 30 to 40 workshops at the rural levels for craftsmen. We suddenly come across very different kind of problems of policy. And Narega problem, for example, it offers 200 rupees where our own craftsmen, whatever we do, could not earn more than 100 rupees. Now, this is a disaster for many of the craft NGOs and all that who are employing. Now, I brought this issue and I came up with one creative idea. Why not we have 50-50? So, any recognized NGO or something, you give Narega program for them, they will pay 50%. Government pays 50%. Instead of 100 days, the craftsmen will be employed for 200 days. Now, this I tried to take to one IS officer who was in charge. I tried to talk to a chairman somewhere. I don't know where to go. Can we have a digital platforms where such things can be expressed and think tanks can be there on the digital platform to look at such problems, you know? Because it's a ground felt, and I can see a lot of damage, you know, because we cannot compete with Chinese products. So if you make this 50-50, we are subsidizing, and it comes into productive work of craft. So craft can sustain this way. I, I think innovations will have to happen somehow in this way. Uh, just a brief, brief intervention. Uh, 
I'm, it, it, what I dis, uh, just now saw is it sort of leads to an idea which we can revisit. Uh, we had technology missions long time back, you know, where C dot and started. Could there be design missions which are, say, have some f ten important application areas where we make teams across different uh, disciplines and across different institutions? And if government can fund missions of that kind, I'm sure there's something could come out of it which can be used uh, effectively. Something which you mentioned, we are setting up a hub at School of Planning and Architecture and we are calling it Design and Innovation Hub, which has a future cities center, an inclusive design center, and a heritage and science center. And we are working with the ministry to put it in practice. Where it will be an inter interdisciplinary center, as it will involve all the SPAs, IITs, and IIT to put in design as a central theme. you are mentioning requires the domain knowledge of say town planning and so on do you mean to say that this kind of traditional uh, way of looking at design from domain knowledge to a solution has not worked and you all of our education system is based on dividing the whole uh, aspect of design system providing everything on domain knowledge for example if you look at financial inclusion the domain knowledge that's required is economics so is it that you think this has failed, number one? Number two is that you asked a very important question. And the design is all about asking questions. If I were in your position, I would ask the question that, why should we have Darvi at all? If we have Darvi, we have problems. And, and if I say that I should have system where we don't have Darvi, then we don't have that kind of problems. So it's very important that the question we ask is what is uh, the solution we get depends upon the question we ask. And we have to train our youngsters to ask the right question. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say something here. Oh, sorry. Sure. <coughs> <coughs> I think to come up with the innovative designs for, for society, we need three things. One, we, uh, we have experienced faculty. Secondly, we have bright young students who, who, who don't know that it can't be done and come up with uh, very unusual ideas. And we are very good at this in, in IITs and other such institutions. For things to scale, the third thing we need is, is a tie-up with, with industry and particularly, I think, uh, profit-making industry if we want things to scale. <coughs> and uh, in, in this connection, <coughs> you were talking about the need for more content on NKN and so on. And so, so I just like your ideas on, <coughs> on uh, to what extent do you think uh, private industry could play a role in, in NKN? Because, for instance, if faculty are to generate innovative content, then uh, at least uh, there needs to be some, some rewards. And, and can some of that come through uh, industry participation in, in NKN rather than relying just on governments, IITs, and so on? Some of these questions? So I'll just take a, uh, maybe two, three questions, and then we'll ha ask you to respond. Uh, I'm Professor Ishwaran from uh, IIT Hyderabad. I just uh, wanted to just give my comment. I am not a professional designer. I'm kind of a professor of mechanical engineering. I just, uh, whatever we can speak of here is essentially about uh, transmitting the kind of design as a skill. Because, you know, that's what educators are. They are trying to kind of impart that skill to others. Uh, but it seems to me a much more fundamental thing is uh, transmitting design as an attitude. Because uh, a designer, if he feels that he can make something, he feels empowered. And that is something that our entire school education takes away from a child. And so the thing is that you kind of do certain things in a certain way. You are hardly ever 
uh, asked to do experiments. If the experiments are there, the experiments are all set piece experiments where you are required to get a proper and correct answer. Now, I think that essentially it conditions our children and our children now I'm talking about people who are coming out of school, which is at the age of 18, we are, they are really adults, conditions them to think in a very, very narrow sort of way. Unless you free up the school education and you say that, look, you can do something, you can design your own experiments, you can do things on your own, try to get your own answers, you will never get people to feel empowered enough to become designers. That's what I feel. And obviously, a lot more people are getting school uh, educated in schools than are getting ed educated in NITs, at, at IITs, or in NID. So I think that that is something that we should also speak about. Thank you. You wanted yeah, to ask? I, huh? I just wanted to say that the f uh, one place where we can apply the design immediately, being a collection of educational institutions, is design in our educational process. I think our educational process needs to undergo a change. Lot more project element, lot more connecting with social needs needs to come up. One problem that is faced is a micro problem which doesn't allow this to happen easily, and that is the uh, issue today of measurements and your uh, money that you earn, etc., etc. So I do not know how to solve the second problem, but the first problem of bringing about a change in the educational process, uh, where engineering gets connected with society and so on. And then naturally, there will be problems of different kinds of uh, issues and problems around each institution which they can work on. So do you have any suggestions on what kind of measurement or what kind of evaluation yardsticks would work if we adopt a different educational process. I have uh, I am probably uh, from the farthest corner of this country. I am in that place for the last five months which is Northeast in Meghalaya. And uh, when you talk about uh, the design, I also understand the problem of developmental issues there. In one hand, uh, the people are very close to their own uh, ideas and uh, the problems and etc. over the years centuries. Another is that of we are talking about the kind of developmental uh, activities which is going on other part of India. My problem is not that. My problem is little different. Different in a sense is that of uh, the, we understand in Meghalaya probably Shillong is the only place where the education takes place. Other part of Meghalaya or other part of Northeast Primary education, secondary education, and even higher education is in a very bad shape. Uh, children, passing percent of children are very, very low. Quality of teachers are not really there. And if that is the situation, what kind of solution you are going to give so that we can talk about the taking the education forward and subsequently design or development can be taken forward? This is my question. Uh, yeah, um, this is uh, Biswal from NIT Raurkela. Um, actually, I had a department called Industrial Design in my institute. Uh, this department was established uh, four years back, in 2000, three years back, 2010. We have been thinking of establishing this department uh, probably since 2007, but we could come up with uh, creating this department in 2010. Um, I basically belong to mechanical engineering fraternity and uh, consistently I came to this industrial design. My idea of design has increased uh, a lot after hearing uh, various people out here. So far as uh, the problems are concerned, I believe there are problems in engineering, what we do in industrial design department. There are a lot of uh, design problems in the community, in the society, in the business. As uh, 
Dr. Sambutra told uh, regarding Bharavi, since I come from a place which is not very far away from the KVK, the unknown area of this country, we have lot many social problems out there. But the problem that I am facing at my institute is since we uh, created this department close to four years back, we are yet to get uh, the correct kind of faculty from various disciplines, not only from engineering discipline. And we have been trying uh, to recruit people, but we are not getting. Will it be possible to uh, create some sort of network where you can make use of people, not even uh, from institutes, from other places? Like, you know, I met a friend today who uh, is doing uh, her, you know, uh, work in design in a very, you know, uh, independent way, in the freestyle way. And can we channelize all these talents who can help us? And can the government uh, put up some sort of, you know, um, effort to, to uh, you know, do all these things in a structured manner? Um, like, you know, somebody suggested, then can we have a sort of uh, ministry who look after this design, things like that? So can the government and the you know, people in the helm of affairs help us in, in, in uh, acting something towards this? One last very brief half-second question. I'll just question. make it uh, brief. I'm Munshi from IIT Bombay. I want to touch upon the issue of post-design implementation, which uh, many times we do a lot of design work, a lot of good design work, but then we find out that uh, what afterwards. In fact, we have uh, finished, we are concluding a project on dry sanitation system for rural uh, areas, which has been supported by MDWS. And uh, we have put up prototypes, which are working well. We have put up a demonstration unit, which is there for the people to see. We asked many people, in fact, a couple of companies were interested in putting as, you know, kind of sample uh, such units in their area of work like Tata Steel and ILFS. But then it will kind of a stop there, it seems. You know, we'll make a report, we'll send it to the ministry, and they will see it's done, project is done, we'll submit the, uh, uh, this thing. And I'm worried that all this good work that has been done by our students and faculty and all that will remain as a part of the, will go onto the shelf, you know. And we have no strategy, policy on how to carry this forward and see that it's implemented on a wider, wider, wider scale. And uh, this is a little worrisome. I would like some, you know, some light on this. How such things? There are many such projects that have happened, you know, and remained in the laboratories, remained on the shelves, and these need to be carried forward and be used by the society for social good. Well, what we have been talking about. So, Thank would you, you like to <coughs> respond to a large number of questions? Sir? I don't know whether it's possible to respond to all of these great ideas. First of all, thank you very much for all the great discussion. I think we, you have raised some very important points. Good participation. I see a lot of emotions, passions, and I think that's a great start. The question is, what do we do with all this? Let me just make some random comments first, and then I have some suggestions as to what we all ought to do collectively. In India, it's very easy to identify problems. You do not need talent in this country to identify problems. Rural teacher is not coming, water is not there, it is poverty, all that is given. And don't get impressed that you are the first one to think of these problems. All you have to do is walk on the street and you know all the problems. Yeah. It is not that we don't also have solutions. I think a lot of these problems also have solutions. Where are the men and women who will go get it done against all the odds? Everybody is expecting somebody else to solve a problem. And everybody is expecting government to give them some help to solve a problem. I have an idea. Somebody comes to me and says, look, I have this great idea, but nobody is funding it. So I tell him, accept the fact you don't have a good idea. If you talk to 50 people and all 50 says, I won't fund it, when will you learn to accept that you don't have a good idea? He says, no, but I have a good idea. 
I said, that's not true. You have to take your idea and carry it forward. You can't expect somebody else to carry your idea forward. You have to find resources, you have to find money, you have to find talent, you have to organize, then you are a leader. Otherwise, you, you are like everybody else. Okay. Most of the time, people are looking to somebody else to give them money so they can spend it. Okay. That doesn't require too much talent. Saying, I have a great idea, I want to scale, give me 10 crore rupees or 50 crores and then I'll do something. I think this is a very serious issue. Everywhere. And with all the respect to all the talent. We have a great deal of talent, but we have not been able to package this talent to get something done. I remember when I was working in telecom in early 80s, people used to say, why are you worrying about telecom? You know, you should worry about agriculture, water, sanitation. India has, you know, telecom is an urban thing, elitist thing. My answer then was, I don't know anything about anything else. Let me fix phones. Not that phone is going to solve India's problem. The point is you have to start someplace. Each one of us will have to take little activity, put a little wedge, keep hammering it, and it will open up. And nobody is going to come to help you. Start with that. But your work will speak. If your work speaks, people will join. Gandhiji used to say, if you have good work, people will come out of the ground. And if people are not helping, get a signal that what you are doing is not that great. Okay. So having said this, I think the real challenge in India is to create people who will create jobs and not create people who will look for jobs. So in answer to your question, I am not interested in training a student who is going to look for a job. I am interested in training a person who is going to create lots of jobs. What good is my getting a PhD and master's and then say, help me? It's funny. We have spent all this money to educate you and now you want some more help. Okay. You should be helping others. So this mindset has to change. That just because you graduated doesn't mean there will be a job for you. You find a job. And if you can't find a job, drive taxi. I've seen a lot of PhD in math in US driving taxi. Too bad. Survive in that jungle. Problem is never there. Problem is always here. I think in India we have not recognized that problem is this and not that or that or that. Government is not doing this, that fellow is not doing it, bureaucracy is harassing me, politician is this and that. It's right here. If you rise, things will happen. Okay. And we got to rise. I think today is the time for all of us to rise beyond certain level that we have been able to rise in the past. Industry has not seen benefit out of design because industry is used to copying products from abroad, selling, why should they worry? They are making already enough money anyway. Until one of his competitions wipes him out with new design, he won't wake up. So designer will have to wipe one competition out of new design, then everybody will wake up saying that guy built a business, I got into trouble because of new design. You will have to look at these kinds of things. My request would be, one, we agree to create a national portal on design. Immediately. We have lots of portals in the country. We have a portal on water, we have a portal on biodiversity, energy, uh, and others. Let's create a national portal on design, where all of these people are shown saying this is design expert from XYZ, this is design expert, this is capabilities. So at least we'll begin to create richness in that portal and we'll also be able to reach people through this portal. Portal should also have services offered. So I'm a teacher, I want to train design. I'm a designer, I want to find a project. I have a project, I need designer. So this portal then will become a rich place for people to connect. Then I would suggest all of us here write one page. Give it to the secretary and what is that we can do? Each one of us. What are you ready to offer beside conversation? Write a page saying, I in this part will do this for the cause. And we don't all need to advise government and prime minister. I think everybody is interested in advising prime minister. 
you know, I always give this great example. I was once in Bhopal, and some young fellow was hanging around, and finally, I connected with him, and he gave me a piece of paper. He said, sir, here is a piece of paper. You give it to Rajiv Gandhi. And if he followed this, he'll be prime minister for 15 years. Every question, every trouble he's going to have, I have answers. I said, very impressive. So I asked him, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> Only in India, the guy who's looking for a job knows how to do prime minister's job. So my request would be to really focus on what you can do in your area. If you're in Bhopal, let's worry about Bhopal for a while. If you're in Mumbai, let's worry about Mumbai for a while. I will also write one page. So we'll all write one page. Think what is that you are willing to do for design? Not that all of it would be very useful, but I think it will give us an idea of how many of these people can do what. Okay. Then I would suggest that we also create per state a team for design. If you want, we will work with you to connect them to the National Innovation Council. Maybe we need a state level design council. We talk to the, prime, the chief minister, we get to the chief secretary and say, look, these are your five design experts in the state and they'll help you. Okay. Then we also create some design councils per subject. You select 10 most important subjects, government, health, education, agriculture, and all of these people will put in some names. So we have sectorial design councils and we have state level design councils. And let them then find work rather than people coming to them. They will say, look, I can help you in the state government on this. I can help you agricultural people on this. I can help education people on this. I'll give you one simple example. We have 32 million court cases pending today in this country. It takes 15 years to get justice. You go to Delhi court, there are rooms 10 times bigger than this full of files. There is no way you can find anybody's case. There are ladders to go find a file. Can we computerize it? So we did. Now all of that information is on one box that big. You can free up in center of Delhi 100,000 square feet of office space. Who wants to resist this change? Some people in judiciary. So design is there. Domain experts are there. They are not talking. Because domain experts feel I'm threatened. Somebody's going to take my job away. They'll find these files. So who is going to ask me? All of this is part of a change. And we have to handle this change. There's nothing new has been happening for a long time. So we'll have to sensitize people as design. We'll have to go give talks and we'll have to prepare video messages and we'll have to create YouTube channel on design, Indian design. We'll have to do all this stuff. Okay. Who is going to do it? this group is going to do it. Don't expect somebody else to do it. If you're ready to say, I'll put 10 minute video on design on YouTube, that's a good start. I think at the end of this meeting, we need to really lay out work for each one of us. Whatever that is, somebody will spend 100 hours, somebody will spend 10 hours. Okay. We have rich experiences here. Maybe you want to put all those design experiences on the web. Indian design experiences. Put it on your portal. Create YouTube channel on Indian design. You know, So portal, per state teams, sectorial teams, um, education material, services. These are the kind of things we need to do. If we do this and then plan to meet on Google Hangout, and not wait for one year for another meeting and lunch and tea. Yeah. We should really have a small group of people driving this effort. Maybe you set up an advisory team of five people whose job is to just drive this. You know, create Google Hangout once a month, have little, you know, Twitter thing going on on design, and just create some excitement. And a lot of young people will come and pick it up. All you need to do is light the fire. If you light the fire, there are enough young in this country who will follow up. They are looking to us for direction. And if we can't give them direction, what good is all our experience? 
there are enough hard working people i have 10 young people in my team they do all the work i get a lot of credit they're great kids smart kids hard working sincere dedicated committed concerned courageous not yet polluted find those kids and they'll join you in this movement it's a movement we got to create design a movement out of this meeting and if we can create that i think it'll happen i'm available whatever little i can do i can connect you to a lot of these institutions and others i'm sure you have here secretary and ministers and they are equally committed so let's give them some help because they can't do it on their own okay it's everybody's work so i hope this is good enough one request i have from my young colleague here he said sir don't forget to remind all the directors of iits to look at gandhi portal you know we did on october 2nd a portal on mahatma gandhi it has 500000 pages of documents it's a great portal now i want different portals to be done on different leaders i want a portal on maulana azad subhash chandra bose jagdish chandra bose Rabindranath Tagore, Vallabhbhai Patel, Nehru. You know, this is the history of a nation. Why can't we do portals? Why can't IITs and others take responsibility to do two, three local portals? Sad part is nobody even looks at these portals. You know, I would request you to tell your students to be creative and create some of these local portals. There is so much to do in this country, I tell you. Work is cut out for 100 years. And I feel too old. I wish I was a little younger. I know I'm almost 72 years old. You know. And let's just get something done. Thanks. That is really inspirational. <laughs> So please do that. <laughs> we look forward to your returning. So, uh, we can then just continue with the two presentations that were scheduled before uh, Mr. Petrolo's intervention. May I uh, therefore request uh, Mr. Javed Iqbal from the DRILS from Hyderabad to make his presentation. Dr. Eddie's many years ago, I even didn't know that you could design drugs. Well, uh, the drug discovery historically had been based on serendipity, that you take some, you make some chemical substance, you try and put it into an animal and see what happens. And then you say, you know, I have discovered a drug. Much later, I think towards the end of last century, uh, with the information technology, and all that was happening around it, even the chemists and the biologists thought that they could actually try their hand on designing of drugs. Now, before I really tell you, because it's the most difficult lecture I'm giving in my life. I have been a professor in IIT and all that. <laughs> Eight minutes and you have to tell to audience about what is drug discovery. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Desai. <laughs> now, uh, just a few uh, things that you must uh, keep in mind next eight minutes that I'm going to talk about. There is protein. I'm sure all of you have heard about protein. Those who have not heard, protein is the main root cause for diseases. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of proteins in our body. Proteins have three-dimensional structures. They are also created by nature by design. 
each protein has its own design and each protein function in a very different way depending upon the kind of disease you're talking about diseases which are involved in infections their proteins are very different in design diseases that are involved in cardiovascular or or let's say uh, lifestyle management diseases their proteins adopt a very different kind of structure or design now what happens really we drug designers what we do normally is first try to understand the structure of that protein which is highly complex and try and see in a three dimensional way as to how that protein looks with the advent of crystallography information technology and all that we have seen in the last 30 40 years the understanding about the protein structure is very well known now i mean i could crystallize a protein and i could say well this protein has this kind of three dimensional structure or design so what happens really is as a designer what i need to do is that i must design a molecule and when I mean by designing, I first sit on my computer, do some kind of virtual designing, or virtual screening as we call it. Then we go to the laboratory and make them actually. Making, of course, is very trivial nowadays because chemistry has become more like a technology. Now, what I'm going to talk about is that, first I'll tell you how there is a very long road to new drug. It takes almost 15 years. It, it, it sort of costs you, if you're talking about lifestyle management disease, something like $800 million. When we were in Dr. Reddy's, when I was in Dr. Reddy's, we embarked upon a program of diabetes research where we were supposed to bring a drug that we indeed brought to the clinic, but it failed. And I can tell you that most of the drugs that researchers do fail. The one that you see in market actually is the result of a very long drawn battle of almost 15 20 years with a military like operation that you see a drug in the market obviously all that was happening because people were not using the design principle serendipity was the name of the game and therefore you make molecules you put in animals and then you say well hurrah, this has happened i got a drug now those days are gone with the advent of computers and all these technologies that we have information technology, bioinformatics, and what have you, we now really understand designing a drug in a much better way. OK, I just told you all this. I don't want to bore you with this because uh, you know, I just wanted to show you not m meant to be read, but I'm just trying to see the complexity that is involved in drug discovery and design. It is actually mind boggling. It is not something that you can just do at the drop of a hat. It requires tremendous amount of teamwork, a lot of patience, a lot of failures, learning from the failures, and how do you go about each failure teaches you the next step, what you're going to take. Now, uh, what I'm trying to show is that it involves all elements of technology, science, and what have you. There are something like 15 disciplines that are involved in drug discovery and design. We only sort of underplay it because each one of us are so in interlinked with the kind of knowledge that we have that no one person is responsible really for inventing a drug. Okay, be that as may, I just wanted to show the there's a something called cell. I'm sure most of you know. This cell has a membrane that has to be permeated by a drug molecule that we make and it should get into this. But there are a lot of barriers to this drug molecule entering into the cell because cell is comprising of some very complex structures. That is also by nature. Design, nature has made by design, and therefore it would not allow everything that you make to get into the cell. And cell is the heart of where every uh, action is taking place. Okay, so one has to understand all these before one really sits down on a computer, look into the complex structure of drug, and try and see if you can design a drug. Okay. Now, there is something called virtual screen. I've already mentioned to you about it. This is nothing but this basically requires uh, you know, structure-based. I'll tell you a little bit about these things. I'll just put, let me put all this. See, if you look into this, there are certain different ways in which you can look into it, where this is a protein structure, which is typically shown here. We take a molecule that we virtually design and put into this and see where this molecule, or drug rather, sits in the cavity of this protein. Then we have other thing called ligand-based quantitative structure. Because if I change the structure of a drug, how it changes the property of that drug towards a particular biological response. 
then what we know is that we try and see I'm sorry uh, then they, we construct a certain philosophy hypothesis by making a triangle like this say if a molecule fits into this triangle and if that drug is fulfilling this requirement then I might be able to get a drug that would actually hit that particular protein target that I want to actually uh, stop from functioning then there is something called knowledge based which is a chemical biology network which requires tremendous amount of bioinformatics knowledge that has been unearthed by the protein structure that has been now unraveled over the last 20 odd years especially after the human genome sequence was unearthed okay I will not bore you with this let me please remind me uh, just two minutes before by this thing see what a chemist sees I as a chemist trained as a chemist I would like to see my drug aspirin which you all know which is like this sildenafil which is actually a very important uh, drug uh, and actually it looks like this okay this has become very important nowadays so as a chemist I see a spirin like this where I have a bond I have a CH3 I have an oxygen I have a benzene ring similarly in sildenafil I, in, I see like this however protein does not look like this proteins okay sorry here what you do you convert this into a one dimensional structure into a line notation which would be like this I can simplify this structure by design and I can put these things like this this is a model called smiles but a protein does not see these like protein sees my spirin and sildenafil or Viagra like this it is a sort of cloud that actually surrounds this and this is how protein looks at it now what are these red and blue things you know every molecule has a electronic structure a cloud of electron around it we chemists make it very simple by drawing lines and calling C O N in reality actually if you look into a molecule a molecule would actually look like a cloud of this kind where some place it will be negatively charged some place it will be positively charged and this is what a protein confronts when it comes across an aspirin molecule or a Viagra molecule. Now, let's not go into this. It could be understood by simply electrostatic fields. If you happen to know a little bit about it, you would actually appreciate what I am talking about. Okay, so what really here is, when, you, when, a, when a molecule is like this and when a protein sees this, you can further simplify this by design. Now, what you do is, aspirin now has been sort of it has been segmented into a green and a red sort of area where green is hydrophilic water loving and red is hydrophobic water hating protein if you look into protein contains enormous amount of water molecule inside protein structure three dimensional structure is actually is because of water and okay so what I'm trying to say is that that water hating and water loving for a drug becomes an extremely important phenomena and this is com completely characterized by designing the molecule in such a way that certain part of the molecule or drug uh, has a property of water loving certain part of the molecule has a property of water hating and this is how it would go and sit in the cavity of a protein and block the function of that particular protein so this is how the protein sees a particular drug like aspirin or Viagra now we, we can then do a lot of other you know, things like QSR based things and all that stuff and then too. quickly and I'll show you how we, we put this into pro this this is a protein and this molecule in this big one is a, is a drug molecule and we put into a grid try and look into the interaction this has with the protein and when we I talk about interactions it is electrostatic interactions molecule has a certain charge protein has a certain charge how these charges are going to complement each other in terms of accommodating that particular drug molecule into the cavity of the protein so this is how actually you go and then you can further simplify by design by looking into red area and green area or yellow and green which is nothing but these are all electronegative and electropositive areas now what we do last one minute I'll tell you how we do, do designing this is where designing comes the pro background is all protein you can see this is my drug now I want to design this drug in the environment of this protein which I can see on my computer and then what I do I do what is known as scaffold hopping 
I removed the middle part because I think that middle part was not fitting beautifully into the environmental protein. I do a bit of calculations, a bit of things, and I then look into this and see what are the distances between these, what are the donor acceptors and charge and all that. These are things that are part of the design that we do. And finally, we bring a totally new part in this, which now is called scaffold hopping. And this basically becomes a new drug. So we started from there. And I'll tell you, uh, HIV, uh, this was a drug that actually everyone uh, has been talking about. This is the molecule. Now, those of you can sort of have a little understanding of this sort of structure you've realized that this structure is very different from this structure. If you just sort of concentrate on that. And this has been done nothing but by designing the experiment and looking into it in such a way that you can completely transform this original structure into this. And therefore, these do have similar biological properties, but different structures. This has come about by design. And I can show you in the environment of protein, one molecule of HIV protease is like this. The other one, you can see, is different. And both work or function the same way, but have a slight biological response. Now, I would stop here, because it was very difficult for me. I thought eight minutes would be too long. But I think it's all over now. And thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Punk Mr. Pankaj Vijay from Tata Motors. And that'll be then followed uh, by uh, Aman after that, you, after Mr. Chenja. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. And it's indeed my privilege to speak in an August gathering like this. So I promise not to touch upon design education. Uh, that will be uh, quite. Uh, but I will speak from a customer's perspective, because I am a customer, as the industry is, for the output that you would bring out. And I would also share partly the pains that the industry has, which we hope that together we find a way to bridge as we go forward and, and, and multiply the amount of output which comes out of people who are expected to be creative. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So basically, uh, where should design be taught? That's one key question. And uh, I'm slightly on thin ice here, uh, because all the gentlemen from IIT is here. And I have some recommendation at the end of it, which we may not agree or see eye to eye on, but I leave you with that thought behind. Uh, how is it different from product design? Because industrial design is much more known uh, in India. It's been practiced for many years. Automotive design, per se, is a very new field. And hence, I wanted to highlight the difference between the two as it stands. What are skill sets required, and what will make us, make us succeed? A little prescriptive in the end, but uh, that's how it goes. Uh, the key highlight I want you to take away from this slide is that uh, design is a marriage of art and technology. And it's very important because technology we all understand. Art is slightly different. But in the end, if these two are not balanced, uh, there is a disconnect. And we have survived for so long in India from the situation where we were based on a very technology-centric uh, angle on design. It's not something that we can uh, depend on for a long. We have to bring in the element of art. Yeah. It's very right brain, And this is where the disconnect starts, actually. Because suddenly, we expect a guy who has had creativity hammered out of him since school, where he drew a red leaf, and his parents gave him a shot and said, the leaves are not red, they're green. And then he came to school, and he asked three questions. Somebody mentioned about inquisitive mind. And the teacher said, hey, are you trying to be too smart? Because this is not what you're supposed to do. I've given you notes. Please mug that. You know, and suddenly, we expect him to come to a design school and be creative, and then come to an industry and start producing designs. I don't see how that's going to happen, and especially it cannot happen in a capsule of four years or two years unless, and unfortunately, the Honorable Minister had left, and my, recommend, my request to him would have been to actually bring that in uh, uh, from, so I'll repeat that at the end, OK? Uh, uh, very quickly, and this is just to highlight again the, the, the bridge of art. And so it's an issue of tangibles and intangibles, the rational and the emotional. You know? And all, uh, all of these is what we need to touch on as we design. And there's a, there's a gentleman I worked for a very long time. And I was coming from a product design background. And uh, he always used the most complex or complicated form of design. And I used to tell him, product design is quite complicated. We have all the elements that you have to look into. And he said, no, car design is at the pinnacle, because it is the most complex. And also, it's most emotive. And I, I used to argue. And he, he silenced me one day by saying, imagine you have a girlfriend. I was not married on those days. And you have a girlfriend, and you went home in the evening and said, I designed a nice washing machine today. 
and how impressed would she be as against if you told her I designed a new car today? And that was kind of the end of the end of the argument on that. Uh, it has about cultural issues, it has about environmental issues, and car in that sense is one of the more complex forms of this thing. And this is a quote which uh, uh, is very difficult to guess who it could have come from. So it talks about this, this company being in the art, entertainment, and mobile sculpture field. And this was actually mentioned by Bob Lutz, uh, who took over General Motors at that time as a head of R&D. Design was also reporting to him. Uh, this was, of course, before GM went into receivership. So, and I, I, do, I won't put the blame on him. But this is how he described the whole business of, of design and car design. Yeah. So while it is a personal use, and uh, again, in India, it becomes more complex, because while we take our decisions based on emotional uh, emotional uh, arguments, we want to rationalize it in the end. I think many years, and e I think each one of us, if we put our hand on our heart and said, how did I decide on which car I would like to buy? I mean, somewhere mentally we had made up our mind, saying, I would like to be seen in that car. It's an extension of my personality, you know, whether it's any product. But then we start rationalizing it, because being men, we cannot be emotional. You know, then we talk about fuel efficiency, resale value, robustness of the car, and things like that. But somewhere it's a personal uh, choice that we make based on what we would like to be seen in or what we like to be identified with. Its application and mobility application brings in a lot of issues about safety, whether it's pedestrian safety, your own safety. It's about environmental impacts of, of, of the vehicle that it brings to you. It has a synthesis of fashion, technology, diverse materials, processes, and you name it, and it's there in that. And of course, I already mentioned the purchase criteria are primarily emotive, and then you rationalize it in the end. Yeah. What are design considerations? I'll just briefly touch on these. Basically, it's in the end a need satisfaction. It's both primary and secondary, emotional and rational. And that's the primary primary delivery of any product, no matter whether it's a, a, a pen or a car or uh, your shirt that you wear. It's a value proposition. In the end, are you paying more or less than what value you are getting out of it, whether it's uh, perceived value or a uh, realized value. It's also about personality and style statement and about a brand story. In the end, it has to tell a cohesive story about the brand. Yeah. Secondary influences are about fashion trends and tastes. So the cars, and I'll touch this a uh, little later again in my presentation, that how does time become a very important factor in car design? It's about usability aspects, because while a guy might buy a car based on the exterior looks, in the end, his repurchase, or the, sorry, the repurchase of that car, whether he stays with the brand or not, will depend on how comfortable was he in using it, how was the interior of the car, and that is where his decision to go back to the brand comes back or not. It's about technical requirements. It's about, of course, I'm not talking about money because that's the underlying aspect of all this or what is the kind of investment that you're making on that. And it's about tertiary influences, about product segmentation, product positioning, because we have to differentiate products. There are different buyers with different needs, different purchase criteria. In the end, we have to connect with different people based on different products that we carry in our portfolio. And about the maturity of a segment. If you look at AquaGuard, it was two aluminum tubes which were bought when this first started, and people used to buy it because they were buying safety. And the whole advertising, advertising campaign of that company was, look out for your children. If you don't care for your children, you not buy my products. It's about fear. It, it was about fear psychosis. Now, 20 years down the line, products are softer. They are more plastic injection molded bodies. So they are not becoming products. They were actually technical objects before. You know? And that's the maturity of a segment. Or when we come from a basic uh, uh, needs uh, solver to something where you start getting emotionally connected to it. And this is a difference between, which I wanted to highlight between products and automotive. One biggest aspect is the time scale, and I'll expand on that a little in the next slide. It's about whether it's a product development cycle, it's a total life of a product, or it's about a life cycle animation that we carry out. It's about investments. And uh, this is basically different between the kind of investment which goes into bringing a product to the market versus bringing a vehicle out to the market. Not only in terms of the sheer direct cost, but also the infrastructural costs that you put into it. And the, the scale of it is so different that the risk that you are willing to take with something as design, a fashion garment, with all due respects to the ladies from NIFT, uh, as against a car were different because one has to last six months, one has to last 14 years or 20 years. And one has to have an investment of a couple of crores versus maybe thousands of crores. And that's where the management becomes more risk uh, averse or less sensitive to say, how can I de-risk it more and more? And about product complexity, I already covered that. So this is a typical time frame of a vehicle, if you look at it. We start at zero minus four years, zero being the year when we would launch the vehicle. We start about four years typically. I'm talking about a brand new vehicle from ground up, a couple of aggregates being carried over. We do a launch at zero year, and then that car has to extend its life for about 16 years. Now, what I'm, why I'm talking about this is suddenly you expect a designer who's sitting there 
to say what will be current, what will be modern 16 years from now, which will still help me connect to a customer. Now, this is where the challenge of a designer comes in. Not about how good is he at sketching or designing a digital model or understanding what is the customer wanting today. He has to extrapolate to say what is it that a customer will want 15 years from now, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, and still be able to connect with my product. And not only, of course, not in the same phase, they will do be a couple of refreshes, there will be some changes, but the basic vehicle does not change. Because each change costs something like six months to 12 months to maybe 10 crores to 30 crores. Yeah. This is a typical development cycle, I won't dwell on it, but basically we have a funnel process, we go from sketches right here down to digital. So it's a very complex process. Again, the whole idea being de-risking it at every stage. And this is where I partly uh, also have my uh, doubts on how much will a digital uh, method of dissemination of knowledge work? Because suddenly, in the end, it is about touch and feel. Because the day we have, of course, my, ch my, my son is very happy saying, I want a digital vehicle. He can speed it, race it on the computer. But we are not designing cars for digital world. We are designing cars for look, feel, touch, and moving in them. Until that doesn't happen, we still have to go through the physical route of able to design and touch and feel and need some acreage for the colleges. It may not be 250 acres there. Uh, I'll skip this one. So basically, the skills that we're looking at, we had conventional skills that we required, and uh, this is where we are coming, uh, I think, last two minutes on my talk, is basically we had typical things like exterior design, interior design, color and material, but we have newer skills, and this is where I think the forum here could uh, look at, because these are skills where there are a lot of bridges between different aspects of technology, different technical inputs that a car requ uh, development requires, and this is where also a bridge between art and technology starts differentiating itself. So there are soft skills which are about trending, forecast, extrapolation, and these are areas which I think are difficult to teach in a very structured environment. It is more art side. I'm not saying art schools should become design schools, but there has to be a balance which has to be found between these three. And we have also uh, softer skills which students have to come, because in the end, the designer has to stand up in front of a board and say, please invest in my design. He has to communicate. He has to sell his vision. He has to sell his idea. You know? And that is where those things are not something that we teach today in, in, in our schools. Uh, I'll just skip this part. So all we're saying is design an ecosystem. Because we are not talking about just having designers, we're talking about designers, modelers, clay modelers, guys who work on interfaces, lighting designers. So we cannot just create two designers and say you will design the car, because we are talk about, talking about 100 people working on, on, a, on, a, on a product. And in the end, we, under the whole ecosystem is available. There's no way we can put out a product in the market which is expected to compete with the, with the global best. And what are the drivers from the Indian industry? Why should we look at it? Because suddenly we have to be globally competitive. A customer is not willing to give us any discount for the fact that we are manufacturing out of India or we're designing out of India. Because he has access to the latest information, his aspirations are as global as anybody else's. So there's no way he will look at a substandard design or a, a product where gaps are not even or the color is not, not matching between five parts today. So he wants the best. And if he's willing to give his money, he wants the best product that that, that product can, the money can buy. We're looking at international platforms, so products which are available in Brazil are available in India today, and companies are importing, they're exporting from here. So there's no way we can say I can get away with the substandard. There's no cost arbitrage. The entire um, investment in design compared to a full product development cycle is minuscule. So no company is looking at a cost arbitrage to say let me save some money by designing in India. It will not happen. Unless they're getting the best out of the Indian designers or the Indian design studios, they will not come to India and invest. And this is the biggest challenge. Unlike the software industry, the IT industry, where, where labor arbitrage worked for a long time, this is where, uh, where the difference lies. And of course, on top of that, there are needs to identify local opportunities, because each country has a unique uh, requirement in terms of usability, how a product uh, means to a customer. So any company can identify that and bring that, bring that into a product is something which has a higher chance of success. And of course, there are different companies with different requirements. So we have Indian OEMs who have to grow and learn on their own. We have companies from abroad who are coming and setting up shop in India who can get mentors from abroad and guide the students so they can teach their own, own, own students for the initial couple of years. And we have design service organizations who are willing design, to sell design services. Yeah. Prescriptive, last slide. My thing is IIT should capitalize on the ability to network across departments because you have engineering, automotive, you have aero uh, uh, departments and these are all skills which go into the, uh, into the product. They should not get into a specialization where art is the driver. Unless we change the method of recruitment, we change the method of selection. Again, my bring is suddenly you have a guy who has appeared for JE, who has you know, learned coaching, who's mugged, who knows maths like inside out, and suddenly you say, now be creative. 
you know and somewhere there's a disconnect between between these two and of course uh, between UG PG but again I, this is something I can I can skip on this thank you very much so may I request Amanda Amanda to talk on how governments prefer fossils to heritage <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I actually changed the title of my uh, presentation because it seemed a bit too harsh. I thought they were senior members of government. Um, so it's, it's now called uh, um, Burying the Designs of India's Past. Okay. Even though I was told to talk about my work, I. I'm actually more interested in the generic problems, which I think are more interesting for us to uh, discuss than to uh, show one's work. But I will divide it uh, in, a, um, in two bits. Also show lots of pictures, because you've heard lots of words. So when you are in New Delhi, um, you see the Arc of Triumph uh, from Paris, which is built here, because Lachens went to Paris and he loved it, so he wanted to uh, reproduce it here. He also, um, there's a lot of correspondence from the British about the Champs Elysees. They say the, the King's Way, which is Rajpat, well, should be that much bigger because their whole competition is Versailles this much, so we have to make uh, the um, Governor's Palace bigger and so on. So they are doing, the British are outdoing the French. Uh, on Indian soil, because the, the Buckingham Palace isn't large enough like Versailles. Baker is the one who's won the competition to build Delhi. So this is Pretoria, and this is what looks like uh, Vijay Chok. So if you see this. So w what we are getting here is actually something which is totally irrelevant to us. Um, Edwin Lachan wanted to build the Church of Rome as the house of the Governor General because he thought it was the most beautiful uh, monument building. And he said, we will fit you know, the, the bathrooms and bedrooms into this. It will be fantastic. And what we eventually get is this. Because Lord Harding is the Viceroy, so look, look, look at the design inputs. On top, we have a third century Buddhist stupa this is Islamic kiosk, which, which come with all, with all the wonderful buildings. This is a Renaissance first floor. And at the bottom is the native floor, which is Elora. I'll show you. This is the first drawing of Lachans of Sanchi Stupa. Not because he wanted it. He wanted to build the Church of Rome. But Lord Harding said to him, we are spending Indian money to give them a building which, of which they should be civilizationally proud. So at least from the outside, make it slightly Indian. Inside, of course, it will be Edwardian because we have to live in it and uh, we rule them. So it's actually, he sent to Mandu to see this. He comes back and says it's utter, utter rubbish. But he uses some of his genius to make all the kiosks that you see on top. He inverts them and makes them into fountains. But this is Elora. This is this, the entrance, uh, the bottom, from where the uh, staff and servants had to enter. So he said he would make a native entrance, and Elora was the native architecture, cave architecture, because we live in caves. Yeah. All these jalis that you see in the Rashtrapati Bhavan are all copied from the Red Fort. These are, these are very, very detailed designs of that. And this is what Lachan, the architect, has to say about one of his fellow architects, he said, Swinton Jacob. He says, his buildings are culled from various buildings of various dates, put together with no sense of relation or scale. But what about his own building? That nobody is here to judge. So what does India get? India gets Roman architecture because they're trying to make an imperial point, which goes back to 44 BC. Then in England, uh, no, then Palladio actually evokes it in the 14th century. Uh, 16th century, then Inigo, Jones, and Christopher, they're English architects who then revive it. And we get this in 1912. It is a re -re -re renaissance. And we are supposed to 
imagine this as an Indian building and be very proud of it. So we have no eyes to see what design is. We are, we are so gullible, we accept anything that anybody gives us and we say, what an extraordinary building. I've actually done a book for the President of India which is called Dome Over India, which details all this. And if you read it, you'd feel very um, unhappy that we have people like Lachan who says, personally, I do not believe there's any real Indian architecture or any great tradition. And Taj Mahal is wonderful, but it is not architecture. And its beauty begins where architecture ceases to be. And we, are, we today have, we call La the Lachan's bungalow zone in Delhi, Lachan's bungalow zone, when not one bungalow in that is made up by him. So we have no sense of history. A man who, who hates us, this is what he says about Indians. He calls us black, black moors, niggers, dark and ill-smelling. He finds our food strange and so on. So he says we have very low intelligence and he cannot admi admit them to be on the same plane as myself. And here we are honoring this man who even the British Empire, it was, it was called New Delhi when it was suggested that they, uh, you know, they should call it uh, Mary, Mary Bad and George Gard and all that. But the emperor said, forget it, just call it New Delhi. So after independence, we wake up and say, oh, here's a great British architect because he's British and name everything after him. There's even a hotel. And I did an analysis of the Taj Mahal, which is an equilateral triangle. And Viceroy's house or Rashtrapati Bhavan. If you look at the triangles and the shapes, you'll get to see how imperfect Lachans' building is. And to go even further, this is an Englishman who's being honest. He says, Lachans took Indian architecture and used it in his own way while noisily saying how inferior he thought it was. And Robert Byron, who's a writer of that time, talks about never was so large, so planned, so arrogant, and so lovely a palace built. And I shall now show you the proportions of this dome. The dome of this building is two and a half times that of its base. There is this wonderful thing in Islamic architecture called the pishtak, which is a, a structure which is built to cover this, the naked neck of the dome, which this man doesn't know anything about. And if we were to take the same example, this is what the Rashtrapati Bhavan is, which is perfect poetry in all that the British call it, you know. I also took the liberty, because there's this Lachans Trust who glorifies him and thinks the holiest architect, of taking his building, this is the front view, this is the back view, and if you see these little kiosks, which are totally unproportionate because it's a U-shaped building and in the distance we lose the scale. So this yellow structure is what I have done with his building, and you can see that that triangle that we are talking about is much more perfect. This is not how the building is. This is how it should have been, and this is how it is these little mousy kiosks over here. So what I'm actually saying is that why don't we as Indians have the courage to see how we are different? We are the only living civilization in the whole world. i go back to this. And the only living civilization of the, of the, of the ancient world, the Greek, the Roman, the Mesopotamian, ba Babylonian, even the Chinese, have all destroyed themselves. So we must have many points of great strength. Look how India deals with Islam, which is uh, considered a threat, invasion, and so on. Countries like Syria, Jordan were taken by the Arabs within a few days. Egypt took 20 days to be brought to its knees. Iraq took three months, Persia, three years. And 400 years after Islam came to India, uh, they became its rulers. So rather than take destruction, there was a lot of destruction. There were 28 Hindu and Jain temples in uh, Delhi. Uh, which were destroyed to make the Kutub Minar. But what India does with it is, it turns even destruction into s syncretism, and we get, let's say, the tree of life, which is not so beautiful in any other Islamic country or any other country which had, had a face off or a simulation of Islam. And just look at the magic that India turns it to. I'm just running very quickly through this. These are things you know, but to know that such extraordinary beauty comes because of this marriage between these two, however abrasive it was at the beginning. Okay. Now this is, um, I'm now coming a, to a little bit to the design point. Um, my closest friend from childhood said to me, 
to design a house for him, which I did. This is a house in Faridabad. And he, he was very, he said, you've created a huge problem for me because people come every day, stop outside and say, can we see it from inside? So I said, you can ticket it if you want. But um, he wanted to ent enter it for the UNESCO because he read there was some award for some architecture. And he entered it. He got a letter from that saying that the house was very derivative. Now, derivative is a derogatory word which we don't use for the Rashtrapati Bhavan. We don't say it's derivative of Rome. But why should anybody building an Indian building in India be told by an outsider that it's derivative? But what, what, where else should it derive from, you know? This is the entrance of the house. This is the, the Tulsi chalk. As you enter there, you look up. This is made with the 16th century old bricks. It's, uh, I'm not an architect. I'm a historian. But I take the liberty of practicing architecture. So these are three words which are now considered pe pejorative, derivative, revivalist, and ethnic. It applies to Indians doing the Indian thing. So actually, when we are discussing design, whatever your institutes will, I think it's very important for students and for teachers to know what is fusion, what is hybrid, where does it become mongrel, you know, when um, you get all the wrong ends of the genetic. And where does it become harmonized, syncretic, integrated? This is actually subject for a much more exciting talk than eight seconds or eight minutes. But the tragedy is that we are so falsely obsessed by our doing ourselves to be someone else, just to please others. It's, it's something which is very peculiar to us. And I was thinking of a ridiculous example of this, which is this. Almost as if we wanted to dress our grandmothers in mini skirts because the West was coming to see how modern we were. So today what happens is the architect, I was talking to a, a, a colleague, says that, you know, everybody's hiring Singapore architects and making their offices, hiring Indian architects to be their sort of junior assistants and all to handle them because none of the rich Marwaris who want to build these houses have faith in Indian architects. But they don't mind them as the second people. And then just to bit about my work, and I'm um, well, uh, unhappy actually that uh, Dr. Petroda left because much of what he said is, is not true because I've actually been doing what Gandhi said. He said, find purpose and the means will follow. I have uh, been uh, involved for 30 years in rest re restoration, have done 30 buildings, have financed it myself, created a lots, lots of employment, seen that rural people do not migrate to, to the cities, and at the end of it, all the only ob obstacle that we face throughout is the government. So it's all very well to say this government has done fantastic work, but if everybody is ready to vote it out, there must be some reason. So this is Nimrana, for those of you who don't know it, which was an utter ruin. It, it's a 15th century fort, and it was on the market for 40 years. So it was, it was not bought, it was bought for seven lakh rupees, but nothing is cheap on the market for 40 years. And it has now been turned into um, a heritage site. These are views of it. I'm, I'm just rushing through it. This is a, b a bungalow on the beach, a Danish building, be because uh, the Danes bought from the Raja of Tanjavur some land to um, trade in pepper. Because pepper, not because they used to eat it, but because it was very good for conserving the animals in, in, in winter. So this is a 400-year-old building, which, was, uh, which is on the sea. And this is what we did with it. And all that we had from the government of Tamil Nadu was to come and say, how dare you build something so close on the coastline? So we said it's been there for 400 years, just in case they hadn't noticed it, and that we were only restoring it. And everybody kept saying, all you have to do is to go with a bag. So people always say, you should have a liaison officer who does all that work for you. But what is that work? If you're restoring India's heritage, do you need to bribe people to do that? It's absolutely amazing. This is Tijara, Fort Palace. It would have been lovely if this conference was actually held here. We have lots of place for you, and you would have been a more captive audience, uh, not able to escape. These are some before and after pictures. We have a 60-year lease on this, and this is three and a half years after. The government of Rajasthan has, has made a nuisance of themselves 
to, 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 create, to send warrants of arrest for us because we, we distributed sweets, we, which we do every weekend for, for all the labor, because somebody spread a rumor that a forest officer had died and we were celebrating that because he was sitting on our file. Perhaps, uh, you know, and I, of course, had no idea that he had died because uh, we had nothing to do with it. But this is the level at which you are treated. These are just some fun before and after pictures. And, and the references, the few people who've been here, this is a before picture, I'll show you the next, uh, the next one. Now, people come here and say, actually, this is much bigger than the hanging gardens of Babylonia, or that it looks like Machu Picchu. We have no points of reference which relate to our own self-identity, our pride, our dignity, in doing something, you know. And everybody says, apply for the UNESCO award, but who wants the UNESCO chapa? Why, why can't we just be ourselves and be content with that idea. These elephants are made by a master craftsman from Orissa. Uh, this is at the top of the balustrade of the staircase. And this is what this place looks. That utter ruin. And this is an, uh, another amazing building which is constructed now, which is an underground step well, which I, was, uh, uh, which I had the idea to, con uh, I think that the, the IIT should really be built underground like the Jodhpur one because it's such a hot country. So this is a building that I have designed and built. Um, th th it, it's very simple. You, you dig a hole, you build a building, and you, the earth that you've dug out of the building, you put on top of it. So this, this is the building during the construction. Just two, three quick pictures. And what it eventually becomes, when you uh, enter it underground, it's got a lot of light wells, and there are 32 rooms to live here. This is meant to be a spa. But this is totally indigenous, and nobody's looking at this. I'd like to end, perhaps, by saying something that I read, that we design people, are marginalized people, and we often achieve as individuals what we cannot achieve as a group. So I think that we are meeting here to see how we can, as a group, perform together. And if there's any saving grace, there is a wonderful uh, saying that said, 30 years of the rule of the Borgias in Italy were the worst years of murder and bloodshed but, and corruption and all that you can imagine. And those are the years that gave Italy Michelangelo and Da Vinci. And Switzerland has had years and years of peace and all they invented was the cuckoo clock. So perhaps we should be grateful f for all the harassment that we get from governments because that perhaps is the challenge that makes us do what we do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aman. So the next conference to see how harassed you feel is going to be in Fajara. <laughs> and so Professor Obuchi, may I ask you to make the presentation? Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Desai for, uh, for this great invitation, and also Jaika for sponsoring me to be here. Uh, I'm from University of Tokyo. I'm very humbled to be here with all these uh, uh, you know, amazing professors and uh, uh, directors of universities. Uh, I just realized that I'm the perhaps the only one that not directly related to this whole Indian uh, design conference uh, from the very beginning. So. My talk could be slightly off, so perhaps you can bear with me. Uh, today's talk, I would like to talk about prototyping architecture. I study architecture, uh, I teach architecture, I study architecture, and I teach at the University of Tokyo. Uh, the reason I want to talk about prototyping is uh, it's not really for a particular client that we have or a particular purpose we have, but simply the uh, testing idea, and that's what we call the prototyping. Uh, and also, uh, I think there's some talk about this issue of student. Uh, instead of talking about what the possibility of design can be and what a benefit of the design, I'd like to focus today on what we do in this for, for whom, and particularly for the issue of student. So toward the creative research and learning environment. Uh, the reason I thought I'm going to talk about this is uh, more I go up from assistant to associate professor, more I go up in this ladder, I uh, feel like being a cheerleader. Uh, how to motivate students, how to get uh, money from the government, 
uh, or the grants I get, all those things I have to inspire people to do things. So less to do with what we do, but how to create an environment through which a lot of thinking can be done. So, uh, so where does the creativity come from? That's the main concern that I have, particularly for the student. And how can we learn to be creative? And lastly, how can we teach creativity? It's a possibility. Uh, since this talk is only eight minutes, so I'm just going to get to the answer, and I was a little bit worried that we're not getting to the end of it. So I'm going to get to the end of it and then see how I can explain that. So uh, the guiding, uh, not teaching, uh, I think this is what I learned. Uh, if I try to teach, they resist, just like my kid. If I try to teach my son, he just doesn't want it to be taught. So I have to be really teaching a way to inspire how fun the learning can be. And same thing for even PhD student. I have to guide in that teaching. And teach advanced tools. And I really uh, recognize that, that you cannot just tell them what to do in a very abstract way. So you have to teach them what tools are available, particularly for the digital technology, computation, as well as advanced uh, uh, a digital tool. And the third thing is make a problem, not solution. And that's what I always do. Uh, it sounded kind of peculiar, uh, but the purpose of making, as I said the early prototyping, isn't to make some sort of solution, but identify what series of problems we are facing when we try to make things. Uh, so uh, the purpose is to make a problem uh, and then uh, find a way to perhaps solve the problem in the most creative way. And the lastly, uh, for the student, uh, it's meaningful challenges. Uh, I think a lot of students, particularly in Japan, the purpose of learning is to go up in the higher ladder of society other than trying to become meaningful. So what they do are socially meaningful, academically meaningful, as well as personally meaningful. And those are kind of things we try to teach, uh, particularly my lab at the Tokyo University. Uh, before I came to Tokyo University, I was teaching at the School called Architecture Association of London for nine years. This is a school that, uh, for those uh, teach architecture, probably know the very well uh, known experimental architectural schools in London. And what I learned from them is what I just have said. It's not really about solving a problem, but rather try to address the issue in the most challenging way, the most creative way. And I was director of this uh, lab, it's called Design Research Lab. And one, uh, one thing that we try to do in this lab is how to change the way that we approach to design studios. So instead of semester-based studios, we decided to do entire, this is uh, four semester, uh, uh, 18 months uh, graduate program. Instead we do chopped up the small exercises a student will come and get to do only one project for entire 18 months. So what they will do is start it with a very simple, oftentimes bad idea. Uh, but if you do a bad idea with only, say, 13 weeks project, you never get to the good project because you just don't have enough time. But if you have 18 months to work on a bad project, and in the end, it all becomes really good. So how to really keep developing idea throughout the entire period of time. That's one thing we did. And the second thing we tried to do in this is instead of trying to work individually, try to work as in a collaborative environment. So learn from the peer instead of learn from someone like us an instructor. So students are cross-discipline uh, cross away within the team and try to develop ideas. So that's what I did at the uh, London Architectural Association for about eight years and try to develop the idea even further at the Tokyo University. Uh, this is some of the images. Uh, the reason perhaps I should say that I left London was that digital technology became so good that we can kind of convince ourselves that we can change society on, this, of course, the screen, on the digital screen. So I need to have more creative, uh, definitive criteria through which those ideas can be tested at. Uh, and I'll show you later on, but then move from digital to analog in a much more physical uh, domain. So this is a, my lab in the Tokyo University. I started uh, three years ago. Uh, the great thing about uh, Tokyo University, I think a lot of things here at IIT the same way, 
it's an engineering school. Uh, typically, architectural school is architectural school, it's separate from engineering. But uh, in Tokyo University, it's, it's similar to here. Uh, it, it belongs to the engineering school. Uh, it's very vertical. I think you guys call it here uh, silos. Uh, they don't talk to each other. They're really good at what they do. So what I try to do is not try to make uh, talk to each other because they just don't talk to each other. It's very difficult to do. But creating a project that's a student-led project and then let professor to deal with them. And that's it's possible because there's the one single project that everybody's interested in. They like to participate as opposed to artificially create an environment where they have to talk to, which they don't. Uh, and let me just quickly go to the uh, project I'm working on. There are two types of projects. The one is called architectural prototypes, and the second is urban prototypes. Architectural prototypes is the prototype that very much to do with architectural discipline. Forms, geometry, spaces, those are the kind of things that really makes architects really excited about and what possibility of those uh, forms in relation to how people live and how people experience and feel. And using that as a basis and apply that in urban prototype, which is to do with how those forms and architecture function within a larger scale of society in the urban context. Uh, so environment, economy, uh, politics, uh, policy, these are kind of things that shape the urban context. So let me just get into a little bit more detail of that. Uh, this is the pavilion project that I did uh, in London uh, just before I left and went to Tokyo. Uh, the idea here is how to make uh, a student curious about what they do. So the problem that I gave the student is this is made of concrete. Uh, it doesn't look like a concrete. A concrete is supposed to feel, oh, it's over six minutes. Okay. Uh, concrete is supposed to feel solid, strong, uh, cold, and but uh, the exercise we gave was how do you make a concrete feel light, feel warm, feel something very delicate that you don't really experience uh, in normal context. So student worked on the project, developed this uh, particular material, uh, worked with industry, how the thin concrete can be and how to put together to create this delicate pavilion. And once again, pavilion has no function other than testing ideas. And this is the pavilion that we built uh, right in front of the school in the AA in London. Uh, similar thing that I tried at the Tokyo University, creating geometry. And, and this particular case is how to use the material which uh, reacts or responds to the heat. So when you heat it, it shrinks, it creates a particular geometry, and this is keep heating it and then become a structural and in the end, tested in the urban context how that could become urban furniture. Uh, but more I try to work with those material, realize there's a limited in terms of technology. So going back to very medieval practice of how to bend steel, so we try to uh, accommodate uh, advanced technology in terms of fabrication in a later project. Uh, this is another project uh, which is called circle packing. Uh, the creating geometry was quite difficult, so we thought, is there any way that organizing a little tiny bamboo, uh, this ring, and s using similar material, which is re responsive to the heat, when you apply heat, it shrinks, can you make a st uh, space and also structure in the same way? So the student work on it, and once again, these are all nothing to do with creating a beautiful form, but creating series of problems which they can uh, evolve and develop for their uh, larger project to come later on. So those are the structures that we built. Um, and once again, uh, in the end, became very hands-on, uh, which is nothing to do, uh, nothing wrong with it, but at the same time, we tried to address if any way that digital technology could address these making forms and geometry. Um, the next project, this is, uh, instead of working on the project only in our lab, how do we engage with the uh, local industry? So this is uh, uh, manufacturing industry just outside Toyota factories uh, in uh, Toyohashi, Japan. Uh, when the economy goes up and down, a lot of fabrication shops around the Toyota factory, uh, they lose the job. 
uh, they have this great machine. They don't know what to do with it. And Japan has the uh, the most advanced in terms of use of robotics arms for various manufacturing, but not being maximized in architecture. So we contact them and say any way that we can build and uh, using their uh, manufacturing capability for our purpose a lot because we can't buy these things. You know, a lot for just uh, it's not that that cheap at this point. Uh, so this is a pavilion that we're building right now uh, using this uh, technology that's available locally, but it hasn't been maximized. Uh, we joined venture with the one of the big uh, construction companies, Obayashi, to develop this as a joint venture between uh, industry and educational factor. Um, using simulation tools to figure out what the uh, structures as well as spaces are being organized and students are currently working on. So this robotics arm allows to cut the well and all that in one go. Uh, so how do we use these uh, advanced digital technology into uh, fabrication in our project? And once again, all of those are not really to do with how to build project, but also how to identify series of problems. And the one thing that we found, I think what we're facing is uh, the role of architects has shifted from designing to uh, almost designing so precise that whatever you draw, that's what you manufacture. So there is no uh, tolerance between the drawing and the fabrication. Uh, I'm just going to go very quick because I'm running out of time. Uh, so how does these, those uh, previous pavilion projects are very much architectural discipline. I mean, how does it really work in city? So this project, this is the last project I'm going to show, is architecture seems to be the more you build, the more polluted the city. Uh, the ground uh, becomes more polluted. In Japan, the lifespan of buildings is about 10 to 15 years. That's how the buildings being constructed, demolished, constructed. Demolished. This is almost like buying a car. Uh, so the more you build, of course, the more you're polluting the land. Uh, so is there any way the architecture reverse that, meaning the more you build, the cleaner the land becomes. Is that possible to build in that way? So this project deal with us, of course, interested in uh, geometries and form, which is the brick. That is what you're looking at the right. So uh, when you stack them, instead of stack it straight, this is the brick that deform. So it becomes all the curvilinear geometry. So students are developing a particular way of assembly, assembling these bricks but at the same time, how these bricks could operate within the city to clean rather than to pollute. So, um, quick skip that. Uh, so, uh, get to this point that cr uh, creating this brick out of this highly polluted, but applying a microbe, which allows the brick to be clean as they build. So, uh, this particular project is using toxic uh, soil as a resources as opposed to uh, unwanted material and use it in a way that the uh, building bricks allow them to purify but at the same time use this as a, some sort of temporary structure as a pavilion and use that as a way to uh, clean. So many of the projects I'm working with students right now is how those waste or unwanted material or a result of the industrialized uh, processes created this pollution, but not unwanted, but how do you turn that into a potential resource? So this is one project, the toxics, and also the waste, and also the sewage, and a lot of things that we try to clean them, but uh, in our lab, try to see that as a potential resources to create a different kind of architecture. I'll just keep it there. Thank you. So before we break for lunch, we can just take an, uh, this Rajiv Lumpur on the Human Project, after which we'll break for lunch. And so we, we, all of us will come back after that for the proceedings after that. We're running about 20, 20 minutes behind time to make it up here. So, Mr. Lumpur? Should we break or we have No, we'll take Mr. Lumpur and then after that. Uh, thanks, Professor Desai. Uh, I think uh, I've not met you formally, but the emails, and uh, uh, somehow I'm here. Um, quite an odd lot uh, from, I think, uh, great uh, 
heavy weights all around it, so I'll just try and run through my presentation quickly. Um, uh, if you can, um, well, um, I s from from the basic note uh, that uh, we all saw uh, to to create a, a dialogue, a platform for dialogue. Um, I somehow felt uh, I'm an architect uh, from my background. Um, have not really built any building myself, so haven't really done justice to what I've learned. But I've been on the periphery of design all through these years, and uh, knowing the backdrop of the IITs and the NIDs and all the great institutions, I think design in India is a subject. How to deal with it is a very structured subject which already has a lot of uh, attention on it, and I think uh, all day I've seen uh, it's uh, very well addressed. But design for India, being being in the field and uh, working in the field for clients, for people, trying to facilitate the processes, I somehow felt design for India I is something that, that really um, needs to be debated more. Aman has just uh, taken a, you know, a, a great spell on it. And uh, his works and, and the work they've been doing uh, really outline one key area that where anybody who wants to really engage with India has to face a series of problems. Uh, I think the biggest problem has been built is of perception. And the word ethnic or traditional or any of these words which, which reflect our past are kind of seen as looking backwards. So that, that particular part is what I'll uh, just look at uh, through two projects that uh, we are working on currently and one I've uh, been a part of earlier. So um, yeah, this is the eight minutes on design for India. <clears throat> and and the design for India really means putting a perspective on our cultural past. Uh, and design is, is an act of making something new. So it is not a repetition or a reproduction. It is an act of creating something new. But something that has a cultural link to our past, I think we will be able to own it as, uh, as our own, uh, as something that we create as Indians for ourselves. This is a project, uh, I'll briefly run through two projects. So this is a project we did, uh, I was part of uh, in Jaipur. Jalmal, I think anybody has been to Jaipur would have seen this. Uh, this monument was in absolute ruins uh, for, I think, a century. And uh, lately, government took it up as a PPP project, uh, I think, about 10 years back. Uh, I was heading the project, and I've seen through this entire transformation of, the, of uh, the monument and the lake, which was also a sewage dump. This is something which has happened, and it's been completed uh, about four years back. But what's interesting is the journey that we went through uh, when uh, we started with this idea of, of working with history. And I don't come from a conservation background, neither were the investors who were putting money into the project. This is a PPP, so there were private investors putting money. Neither did they come from any conservation background or actually any sense of being part of, of combined cultural heritage at the build platform. Individually, I think all of us are very, very Indian. Uh, we have our own ways of doing things. We somehow have separated our lives, our working lives, from our actual um, professions or occupations. So for Jalmahal, um, these were the three targets we set for ourselves. We are going to restore, of course, because the monument was in absolute ruins. It needed restoration, but we are not going to stop there. It's not going to be restored just to be a relic from the past, but we also wanted to revive it and also to reinvent it, to make it part of the mainstream, to make it attractive and interesting. Historically, it had been a great place, is what we were told. Nobody, uh, no, there's no written account of this building. So there was a slate which was absolutely clean. To reinvent was a, was a massive task, because uh, you really need to think like probably the rulers in those days would have thought, why would somebody make a building in the middle of water? What was the context? But at the same time, if you were to just reproduce another garden or another monument into inside this building, probably it would be a very boring exercise by itself. So it is restoration, but with a completely new approach to it. Uh, we developed certain tools which we used in uh, making of the project. So transformation is really the key um, idea that everybody is a big team that worked on it. Historians, um, craft experts, uh, conservation architects, everybody came together. But transformation is what we were looking for, not restoration. And transformation, which is led through innovation, of developing technology and aesthetics, more importantly aesthetics, that, that actually works uh, in our context, 
that doesn't feel like it's been reproduced from the past. It has a new thing about it because of the way everything comes together. Collaboration, of course, we've been talking since morning. Actually, any design-led initiative has to grow. Collaboration is really the key. And an ecosystem-based approach, which I'll just touch these subjects quickly. Innovation within the traditional framework is actually a very rare thing. Uh, when we were working, we had a fair amount of time to research and found there's very, very little work, especially in the architecture domain that's happening uh, that deals with innovation of contemporizing uh, aesthetics and materials to make them applicable uh, in today's time. So we, we, we had a fair bit of a run on it. And it's only because of that freshness uh, we're finding a lot of young people, new people, uh, people which have very high aspirations of you know making the Italian house in Jaipur would actually aspire for something which is coming out from their own soil and find it aspirational at the same time. The team, the collaborative team, these are some of the people. The team is actually much bigger. So we have architectural historians. I mean, it's, it's an international team. People from everywhere were involved. And I mean, we were lucky with Jaipur being Jaipur. Uh, there are so many people who have a very strong emotional uh, connect with this city. And that kind of allowed us to tie everybody together. Uh, transformation. Uh, uh, physical transformation is much easier. It, it is transformation of hearts, which we are talking about. When, when we are referring to a monument, a building has to have some impact in, in a, per, a person's uh, feeling for it. And uh, whenever somebody touches an old building, there's always an instant um, conversation on, he's going to ruin it. It, it. it was much better before. It's going to go to the dogs. It's, you know, if you're not careful about it, it's going to go this way or that way. That's, that's always been the case. And, I think that keeps us away from our history in a very big way. We don't want to engage with it because we feel it's very touchy-feely thing. You touch it and somebody will have a problem with it. So transformation which leads to people's acceptance uh, was really very important for us. Ecosystem-based approach uh, was involved in the entire project. Uh, but the key ecosystem we were concerned with is the cultural ecosystem in which we existed, that building. And, and I mean, I think every project whether it is dealing with textiles or it is dealing with buildings or it is dealing with an industrial product works within an ecosystem which is its own ecosystem. It's very important as a design process if we realize that upfront and respond to it as an ecosystem which is cultural references, not just functional, mechanical, programmatic, but also cultural. And we were able to deal with it wherein a building once completed uh, became part of everybody's you know, daily perception. People loved it not only because it was restored, but also there was something new in it for the entire city to look at. So that's one project, and quickly go to another one, uh, which is also happens to be in Jaipur. These two projects have actually tested two different ideas. One uh, is dealing with the past and trying to make it relevant to today, while the second project, it's a mainstream uh, commercial building uh, with five lakh square feet of office space and retail and whatever uh, that goes with the building like that. Uh, right at the opposite end of Jaipur, right next to the airport. So there is hardly any cultural context around us. We are just surrounded with a whole lot of uh, wannabe buildings, which are glass, steel, and everything that our uh, urban environment is covered with. And uh, for this project, we, we actually had we thought there should be a core idea, which is very important for any design exercise. There should be a core idea around which we build. And we set ourselves with two objectives, very simple two objectives. One is the building should belong to Jaipur, and it should look like it is from Jaipur, and it should not be confused with everything else that's happening all around. And so we needed a strong anchor. And second, uh, which is completely tangential to the first one, is we need to use one of the craft techniques as a primary skin for the building. And uh, the idea was to get rid of glass somehow as an experiment, you know, try it out and see what happens. Uh, so with these two ideas together, we started working. We, we had a series of workshops. Uh, we set a team together. I mean, unlike, I think, uh, Aman, we had, I mean, I'm just carrying to your presentation, but we had fair amount of international people coming in, but they were driven by a certain brief, which was, I thought, was very strong and very local, which insisted on everybody responding to that idea uh, of where, where we stand and what we want to build. So after doing a I think almost six months of work on trying to find a visual vocabulary. And it is very, very difficult. Even for a city of Jaipur, to find a visual vocabulary, what we're looking for is contemporary Jaipur. And it's unfortunate. I mean, so many great architects have built in Jaipur. But there is hardly anything that we can say is a contemporary Jaipur. 
aesthetic vocabulary. Historical Jaipur is flooded with visual imagery. I mean, all over the world, people understand it. But contemporary Jaipur is a blank. We looked at architectural references. We looked at uh, uh, paintings. We looked at every form. And not only looked at it, we actually applied them to buildings till we came upon, uh, stumbled upon Laheria. And this particular form of Laheria, which is used for Pagdi, and realized that there is a very strong link of this form, this craft technique, to the city of Jaipur, to the pride of Jaipur. And it's, it's a tradition which is on its almost on its last legs in its refined form, the form that we are seeing this image, or these, which were all images of historical fabric which was used for pagris by the kings and, and in their courts. So Leharia by itself gave a great storyline and uh, then, then the story has been built around it. This is the progression, it, we have not re yet reached the closure of it. So one section of the story which builds on the idea of a local motif, local iconography, try to make uh, and work with it in a contemporary fashion. And the second was the parallelly running was the craft exercise of trying to find a right craft uh, material that we can bring on and, and, and celebrate that craft as, as our skin. And uh, we visited Muradabad for metalworks, we visited Firozabad for glass, and we visited Khurja and Khurja for ceramics and Sikandra for stone. These were the, this was like a palette which also was geographically all around us. These are areas very close to Jaipur and that was the idea to be able to connect with one of these craft clusters. Finally, uh, the team zeroed in on a ceramic and this is a product, uh, this is the application of the ceramic. It's, it's like a bouquet, very simple contraption, but to have it manufactured out of the industry, the kind of unorganized uh, segment that ceramic is. We've been working on it for now eight months. We are coming quite close to our final product. That's very, very satisfying. We've now expanded ourselves between two clusters. So the one is Khurja, there's another is Thangar. These are some of the images. It's still work in progress, nowhere near completion. But there is a color palette which is continuously evolving. This is not the final palette. We are still working on it. The inspiration comes from the Leheria being applied. The architecture responds to the local climate. It's got the narrow lanes, the small courtyards, the tiny spaces that are required in our climate zone. Almost entire building is self-shading. Yeah, these, these are some further evolutionary exercises on the Leheria. And it's, it's 65,000 pieces of this uh, ceramic which is going to go on to the building probably will be the largest application of architectural ceramic in the country i don't know since when and uh, it will be a self-supporting structure this is the final say, set of prototypes that are currently happening and we are able to achieve our size which we were initially told is not possible we have also actually devised a structural system that allows uh, this to be suspended so it's a brand new product coming out of a very small scale industry and I think the same exercise could be applied to so many buildings, uh, so many products and craft techniques. It's just the fact that we are not engaging. And I mean, from the 90s, when we were working as uh, architects, we always felt there was a lack of uh, paucity of budget in the country. Uh, there was never enough money. Uh, there was always this thing that, you know, we want to do this, but there's no money. We want to do this, but there's no money. And today, there is enough money. There's money all around and nobody knows what to do with it and, and people are going all over the world to shop for things, uh, for the best things that they can bring out from wherever they can go and buy. While the actual design fraternity, which is here, has somehow, I think, uh, so here I am just putting the three key ideas, which I think is where design is, design for India is. There is a segment of design which, is, which was kind of created overnight with the independence, which is the idea of the new India, which is, so design which was born in 1947 with the independence, with the new institutions which were set up. They had a very forward-looking attitude to everything. So kind of shut the door uh, looking backwards. Then there's a second uh, ecosystem of design which probably is religious-based or personal attributes of each of the communities which refuses to contemporize itself altogether. They, they believe in uh, sticking to their own uh, domain and they love it that way. They are happy to segregate their lives, their outside life and their inside life. And the third is what our generation belongs, is very aspirational, is looking at the entire world, wants to adapt anything that happens anywhere, bring it instantly down um, for probably for a token of being Indian, you just adapt it, you probably write it in Devanagari or you, you, you really, really just put some dhoti wala person on it and you adapt that idea which is actually a, a complete import and, and call it um, local. So that's 
where do we reach with this kind of an attitude uh, on design? When we look all around us, I mean, I think any place that we look around, this hotel is a great example, this meeting room is a great example, all around us. We are surrounded by products which we have actually played no role in creation, but we are happily consuming it. We have not improvised on most of the things that have been given to us. We have been using them as it is. So what do we like that we see around us? I think that really, for me, was, was what the curriculum or the idea of the new university should, or the college should look at is, what do we like that we see around us and start picking up from there? Uh, do we want to be global or we want to be Indian? That's, that's a really a, a very important question for us to look at. And or we seek to be an Indian with global understanding, which would be ideal, but then we need to really know what the Indian identity is. That, I don't know, India being a country of the size uh, that it is, leaves us with so many questions that we always try to brush it off rather than look at all the components together. Uh, like uh, Professor Ranjan's book, which came after so many years, is one book which actually documents all the crafts in the country together in a form that everybody can access. These kind of efforts are now happening after such a long time that the entire generation our age and, and younger people have actually lost track of India altogether. They are so happy consuming in the globalized world that for them buying something out of Germany or something out of India, having an aesthetic sense that connects us to ourselves is completely lost. How it can come back, I, I think that's, that's really what design for India should look at. So identity is my key um, thought. If we have and if we can put together an idea of the Indian identity, great minds are all around. I mean, there are people still uh, alive. I think 30 years down the line, 50 years down the line, looking at the trajectory where we are going, probably there'll be very little of this left. So it's, it's, it's a great time, it's uh, the tipping point to actually figure out if we can start putting things together. We're building so much all around us, if we can pay some attention to who we really are. And not look backwards, but look connect the past to go forward. So, are we in the business of adapting for India, or we are in the business of creating for India? That's so, after the very exhilarating uh, narrative that twists the uh, Lahiriya Sari into a uh, beautiful building and I think aptly responds to some of the issues that Aman raised and personally for someone who's seen a stagnant Jal Mihal without the Jal and just the Mihal and the Dam to become something revitalized again it's the right note to break for lunch I think so we can all break for lunch now Aman yes that for doing the Jal Mihal the person involved would ha actually has a warrant of arrest for him yes <laughs> actually no it's the same story yeah, there, there is actually a quite a terrible story. I didn't touch the entire <laughs> No, but it's important to know yeah. that. Sure. It's important to know what we face when we do sure. this. And my definition of PPP in Rajasthan is not private-public partnership, but the private party's problem. It, it's actually just put on you. Everything that the government is supposed to do, you are supposed to do. They can't do it. They won't do it. And they won't let you do it. And when you do it, they'll penalize you and harass you. So you can sure. vouch for that. So actually, I've seen that entire process so upfront, and this was my first brush. But we have seen literally from our eyes NGOs being propped up overnight, newspapers, you know, changing tracks, writing 300 articles on a subject they didn't care nothing about, writing after everything is done. I mean, all of that is also part of the same process. But we are not. I mean, <laughs> I think this is important to understand. Design is politics. We've been saying it for 50, 40 years, but nobody's listening because it's about our intentions to change something and surely it's treading on somebody's toes. So we have to take this into account, but our design schools haven't been taking it. It's looked as, as if it's a technology. It looked as, as if, and you sprinkle, you know, science and liberal arts as a filler on top of technology. It doesn't work. It has to be integral to that. Economics, politics, uh, you know, uh, psychology, sociology has to be integral to this process of creating and making. So actually one of the purposes for doing the uh, no, design education manifesto is to look at some of the constraints and uh, see what how they can be negotiated. It's not going to be simple, but we need to be at least asking those complex questions, bringing them on the table, and see how they can be dealt with. That itself is like what I called earlier designing policies. How do you use design conflicts and design difficulties <coughs> and to influence for the uh, 
You can sit. I don't want to stop people from taking lunch, but I think it's important. There was a book in the 70s called Design, Nature, Revolution by Thomas Maldonado. He again going back to Ulm. He went on to create the you know Politecnico de Milano, and you know the foundation is how do you blend these things together? We've been keeping them separate, but we need to blend it together in a way that they can work, and that's really what. Good. So that's the task set out for ourselves when we close this workshop and continuing the dialogue. But right now we can just uh, maybe break for lunch and have this conversation over lunch. And we two fifteen. How will you? There, you take us ten minutes ago. Okay, half an hour. Let's try convening at two fifteen or maybe two twenty. <laughs> now we've got enough lunch tables. So. Yeah. But uh, definitely by definitely by two thirty. Two thirty. We start the next speaker. Uh, and one more small announcement, we'd like all the speakers in the afternoon to put their presentations up in the computer so that we save time. Thank you very much.